Good morning uh, and welcome to the fourth meeting in 2014 of Rural Affairs Climate Change and Environment <coughs> Committee. Uh, members and the public should turn off phones and uh, other electronic devices that can affect the broadcasting system. Agenda item one is a decision on taking business and private. Uh, the first item is for the committee to decide whether to take the consideration of its draft report on the draft third national planning framework in private at future meetings. Are we all agreed? agreed. We are agreed. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll move on to agenda item two, uh, which is the draft third national planning framework NPF3 evidence session. Uh, for our second agenda item today, um, we have before us, and I can definitely call this meeting historic in the true sense of the word, uh, two ministers, uh, Paul Wheelhouse, Minister for Environment and Climate Change, and Derek Mackay, Minister for Local Government and Planning. I welcome you both with your officials. Uh, good morning. And uh, uh, we, I think, want to fire on with uh, questions to you rather than any statements, but we're happy if you do want to say a few, few words, yeah? Okay. Paul Wheelhouse. Thank you very much, convener. Um, I'm pleased to give evidence to the committee uh, today on the rural and climate change aspects of the proposed National Planning Framework 3. I'm also delighted my colleague, Derek Mackay, uh, Minister for Local Government and Planning, has joined me to respond to any questions that you have on the spatial planning strategy of the proposed NPF3, given that planning strategy is the purpose of the document. Uh, the proposed National Planning Framework 3 is a spatial planning expression of the government economic strategy. It is about facilitating and delivery uh, with appropriate safeguards of our ambition to create high quality places that support sustainable economic growth across the country and realising Scotland's opportunities for development and investment. It brings together our plans and strategies to provide a coherent vision of how Scotland as a place should evolve over the next 20 to 30 years. From the beginning of the process, the Scottish Government has been clear that the review of the National Planning Framework and the Scottish Planning Policy should focus on planning for economic recovery, sustainable economic growth and a transition to a low-carbon economy. Looking across Scotland as a whole, this approach plays to our strengths and it highlights where planning can help to reduce disadvantage. Witnesses have already pro provided evidence on rural and climate change matters, sustainability in its broadest sense, the impacts of and adaptations to climate change, and the facilitation of vibrant rural communities are clearly important considerations which have attracted considerable thought and debate. Turning to our vision of a sustainable rural Scotland, the vision we seek to deliver for our overall future development would see Scotland described as a successful, sustainable place, a low-carbon place, a natural, resilient place, and a connected place. The proposed NPF3 applies this vision to our cities, towns, villages, rural areas, and our coast and islands. We recognise the many demands placed in rural Scotland and our natural resources, and we want rural Scotland to be vibrant and to provide high-quality places to live, learn and work. To achieve this, we need to be positive about development and ensure that it works in the best possible sympathy with the environment. Proposed NPF3 recognises and supports the stewardship of Scotland's outstanding and much-cherished natural environment and ecosystems. Even much of what we now regard as natural landscapes have in fact been heavily shaped by mankind. Our rural environment is shaped by the activity upon it and our strategy is informed by and relates to our land use strategy and in doing so aims to improve the links between Scotland's people and Scotland's land, promoting, sustaining and protecting the irre irreplaceable features in our landscapes and improving the condition of degraded ones. Clearly one issue that is the subject of significant public debate currently is that of renewable energy. While there is much to be gained from micro-renewables and communities throughout Scotland, many of the future opportunities for investment in renewable energy projects, whether they be wind, hydro, wave or tidal, will lie in our rural areas and around our coast and islands. It is therefore important that the proposed NPF3 aims to ensure that planning continues to protect and sustainably use, uh, sustainably use our natural resources to benefit tourism, food and drink, aquaculture, forestry, fishing and farming. Our spatial strategy notes the need to ensure that negative impacts on communities from fossil fuel or mineral extraction activities are avoided and that given the significant legacy which can result, appropriate restoration of sites is taken forward. Developing a transport and communications infrastructure for the 21st century is crucial to rural Scotland and our support for a national digital fibre network combined with more traditional forms of transport, communication and walking and cycling uh, will further reduce perceived or actual disparities between urban and rural areas. This will support existing communities and businesses as well as creating opportunities for them to grow. 
In combination, these aspects offer significant career opportunities, supporting a diverse rural community and economy, and to meeting a vision whereby rural Scotland has a level playing field on which to compete for employment and prosperity. As committee members will, I'm sure, acknowledge, Scotland has amongst the highest levels of ambition and climate change in the world. These stretching targets by their nature will be a challenge, but one we can meet. Our planning system will have a significant influence on delivery. NPF3 takes forward our greenhouse gas emissions reduction commitments, focusing on issues that have a clear spatial dimension. And we see Scotland as having a living landscape, one that can be considered in the round for all of the potential it provides through sound management in sympathy with nature. Our strategy includes the promotion of river catchment scale flood risk management, delivery of our targets for woodland planting and fulfilling our desire for a very significant scaling up of peatland restoration to improve the condition of Scotland's 1.8 million hectares of peatland, and, uh, which are thought to store 1.6 billion tonnes of carbon uh, dioxide equivalent. Our strategy explains what the crucial decarbonisation of both the energy and transport sectors will mean for Scotland as a place and highlights where there will be clusters of development to facilitate this. I welcome the opportunity to discuss the proposed NPF3 with the committee today, convener, and with my colleague, Mr Mackay, and I look forward to answering your questions. <clears throat> Mr Mackay, happy to take questions as well. Keen to move on, so I'm happy to respond to questions. That's very good. Thank you. Um, it's on this the question of synchronicity that I want to ask you first. Um, spatial planning framework NPF3 has to articulate with SPP3, RPP2, uh, indeed the land use strategy was mentioned in the uh, preamble. How do you see us uh, providing that synchronicity in the final document? I think that's uh, an excellent question, convener, and um, we've taken the opportunity for the first time to consult on revised Scottish planning policy at the same time as reviewing MPF3. Now, that seems like uh, common sense. I think it's timely and it ensures that planning policy is updated at the same time as we're delivering this spatial strategy. And also, when we have these conversations in the parliamentary inquiry and evidence sessions into MPF3, it inevitably uh, looks into Scottish planning policy as well. So I think it's timely. I think it's effective. I think there's mutual benefits in having the review at the same time and the consultation so that what we produced are coordinated documents in terms of SPP and MPF3. And then there's that relationship with other government strategies, the government's economic strategy, the transport strategy, uh, the land use strategy, all of which have fed into MPF3. Now, all of them are scrutinised either by Parliament or in other places uh, in their own right, but they have now come to a spatial expression through this document, which is at the top of the planning hierarchy. Of course, I don't need to tell the committee that MPF3 is not a spending document, it's not a project plan as such. It's a planning document that helps guide planners as material considerations. Uh, and to others, it's, it's an investment document, I suppose, as to where we think uh, development will, will feature to, to form much of the government's other strategies. So they inform each other, and convener, if I may, I would say they have a symbiotic relationship with other strands of government work. Symbiotic. That sounds very joined up. Um, uh, SIPA were concerned uh, that uh, NPF3 um, looks very carefully at other than the energy sector and its effect on climate change, but that's got to include peatland protection, the delivery of zero waste and supporting low carbon patterns of development. Now, we're going to ask some specific questions about these. Uh, do I take it from your answers that you consider that uh, they're included uh, sufficiently in the symbiosis that you talked about uh, for NPF3? Well, yes, I do believe that they are. In terms of NPF3, it would set out the planning certainty in terms of what's appropriate for the planning system. But to go further than that, for example, in impact on uh, climate change targets, and adaptation, then that would be something uh, that Mr Wheelhouse would pick up, because clearly that is for a delivery strategy as opposed to the, the, the planning document. But that said, of course, within MPF3, uh, there is uh, the action plan and the, and the monitoring statements. So I would say that 
uh, both in the revised uh, SPP and MPF3, we put a great deal of uh, effort and attention into energy because clarity is required and a great deal of guidance is required, partly because of the controversial nature of this uh, form of uh, development, particularly uh, wind. But that's not to say that it's more of a priority than other forms of energy generation. It's just that more words are required, more narrative, more guidance is required to help navigate uh, through uh, those issues. Uh, and, and, and so I think that we do fully cover that as best we can as part of uh, MPF3. But further work that lies behind this, or indeed decarbonisation of the transport system, would be something that my colleague Mr Brown responded to at the relevant committee where we discussed that. So behind every part of MPF3 is a various strand of government work which ministers can then answer for uh, in, in their own strategy documents and investment plans and peatlands. It is one example where we give greater protection in planning policy, but if you were to probe further on peatland uh, delivery and restoration, then that would be something that the Minister could tackle through his own portfolio. But peatland, I was just going to talk about generality, convener, for me. I mean, certainly, f just to, to answer your question, from my portfolio perspective, uh, MPF3 is very much complementary to the other strategies which I have responsibility for in terms of biodiversity, land use, climate change and so forth, and, and the point that was made by Mr Mackay regarding other ministers like uh, Mr Brown uh, in terms of transport, uh, the same would apply. So uh, I wouldn't expect to see NPF3 reflect the full extent of everything that's in RPP2, uh, land use strategy and biodiversity, but does it support what I'm trying to achieve in my portfolio? Yes, I think it does, and it sits alongside. We've worked very hard together uh, to make sure that it reflects and links to those documents where in appropriate places so that people are signposted to the appropriate advice. But uh, we are obviously working in the background and zero waste strategy and other areas to develop the detail of, of our implementation approach. Thank you. Um, Claudia Beamish, supplementary. Uh, thank you, convener. Uh, good morning to both ministers. <laughs> um, could, could I ask you, um, I, either of you, whichever it's most appropriate to answer, um, in the th third section of the MPF3, a low carbon place, um, on page 20, the quote at the top, which I'd like to draw your attention to, is that it says, our ambition is to achieve at least eight, an 80% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. And I'm just wondering if um, you, you feel that that is a robust enough comment in view of the fact that it is legally binding on us through the Climate Change Act and um, whether ambition is indeed the appropriate word there. And just how the RPP2 as there isn't any more, I believe it was taken out, the, the actual section that was there earlier on RPP2, how we actually can assess how MPF3 is actually functioning in relation to, to it. Uh, do you want to talk about the... If we, Mr Mackay can talk about the drafting of the document, but in terms of the, the ambition, if I may address that point, uh, clearly the Scottish Government, uh, as I'm sure Claudia Beamish is aware, we, we do have a target of 42% of 2020, and uh, in practice that will, uh, given the absolute target we have, that's 44.2% we actually have to achieve, given the change in the baseline. But our ambition is to do uh, you know, 80% as a, as a minimum. That's the, what we regard the science of telling us is the minimum that needs to be achieved uh, by 2050. So 80% uh, is the target. We'll obviously try and overachieve if we, where we can. Uh, but in terms of the ambition, uh, we want to achieve the uh, reduction in greenhouse gas emissions a lot faster than perhaps other nations are trying to achieve. But that doesn't mean that uh, we see 80% necessarily as, as the ring line will do as much as we can to reduce our emissions, and if we can go beyond that, um, clearly I, I, would, I would like to see us do so. Uh, but the science tells us 80% is the minimum we need to achieve as a society, and so therefore that's the, the signpost that we have at the moment. But Mr Mackay may want to address the, the drafting issues. The first thing I'd want to do is certainly reinforce that point. The, the, the term ambition is not to diminish in any way our, our legal expectation or duty or that which we're required to deliver. It's simply how we've expressed it in this section of the document, which takes me to the second point around the, the, the narrative. What we've tried not to do uh, is create a, a policy compendium or a document that is too difficult to read or simply repeats other government strategies or expectations. Uh, so Mr Wheelhouse, I think, as you're well aware, could wax lyrical in our PP too. Um, we, we don't feel the need to do that again in MPF 3, but have set out the, the clear national designations, the policies, um, and uh, indeed the action points and, and references to that. So, that, so that's the route into to further detail. Uh, there. But in terms of the expectations, two important points. First of all, as we arrived at the decisions around both policy and national designation, uh, we used the spaced 
tool. That, that, that's not a, an astronomical term, but a tool in how we assess carbon uh, emissions in some of the designations where we could measure that in other areas, generally assessing what, what impact a decision would take would have uh, as we constructed National Planning Framework 3. But, of course, in terms of ongoing monitoring and contribution, uh, the only known we have is uh, the unknowns in some respect, that we will never be able to determine how many applications actually come in, because so many of them are private sector-led, um, and there have been environmental assessment to each. But we do believe that the general direction and the policies that we deploy will contribute to the reduction in uh, greenhouse gas uh, emissions. And there will be some monitoring over that because there's a monitoring programme of MPF3 uh, and the projects therein, and of course, a, a timeline. But what we don't know is what applications will actually be received over the next few years. If I, if I could just uh, follow that up with a broader question, because there are going to be further questions about the national development some f further on um, in, in the lines of inquiry that we're pursuing. But could I just ask more broadly about how um, sustainable development itself um, underpins, or indeed does it underpin um, this document? Um, and I, I don't want to go into the details, which might appear quite semantic, but I do believe it is quite important to to get something about that on the record? Well, I, I can say in terms of uh, the government's overarching objective, our purpose, of course, is sustainable economic growth, and then we engage in the debate of sustainable development within that. But what has been very helpful through this is the, the debate around definitions. You know, absolutely, sustainable development, sustainable economic growth underpin everything we're doing in this document. That We believe we can deliver greater growth while protecting the environment at the same time. And it is about balance. And when we turn to definitions, that's exactly why, through the review of planning policy, we've undertaken a consultation exercise so that we can have front and centre sustainability as part of our growth agenda, and that features very strongly in both those policies and underpins the work that we are trying to achieve in MPF3. And much of it is characterised by the transition to a low-carbon economy, and that should be um, foremost in people's minds as they're making individual planning determinations and decisions, which, of course, this would be used as a material consideration in any local determination by any planning authority. I think we'll try and move into the specifics with uh, peatland questions next. And uh, to kick that off, Graham Day. Uh, thank you. Good morning, Ministers. Can the appropriate Minister explain why the map of peatland depth in Scotland that was included in the NPF main issues report has not been included in the latest NPF document? One of the issues uh, around uh, mapping is that if we try and provide centrally maps that cover uh, everything, then it might not cover everything, but what we would expect in policy, because the policy applies, and for example around, around peatland protection, uh, there can be no decision around peatland protection that doesn't consider you know, policies that take that into account. So whether it is or it isn't in a map, the designation or the protection to which it would be afforded still applies. And uh, there will be a number of maps that were either in the environmental impact assessment or in earlier iterations of the document that might not feature in the end. But it's not actually the map that counts, it's the policy that applies. And in that, then we propose to continue that protection uh, of peatland separate to, to the work that Mr Wheelhouse would be undertaking. Thank you, Kevin. If, if I may then, if, if I direct my supplementary question to Mr Wheelhouse. Um, in bullet point 419 it says peatland restoration particularly relevant in north and west scotland is planned on a large scale now that's understandable because when you look at the map essentially north and west scotland is where the bulk of the peatland is however the scottish wildlife trust have picked up on this and and, and they see it as a, almost a prioritization of peatland restoration in those areas and they make the point that there are threatened and degraded lowland bogs, for example, in central Scotland and the borders, as the Minister is well aware. So I'd just like to be satisfied that this is not a sort of ignoring of, of lowland bogs. Happy to confirm that. I mean, <clears throat> uh, certainly there, there's obviously work going on to develop the Peatland Code, which will help us develop the, the tools, uh, if you like, the approaches that we need to deploy to, to help work with land managers, uh, whether they are small or large scale. Uh, land holdings across Scotland, uh, but certainly one of the first um, uh, ministerial events I had was with SWT actually at Local Laws 
Reserve, where we discussed um, a number of issues, including raised peat bogs uh, in, in lowland areas. And I, I, I do believe that we, we have a, a, a you know, genuine uh, need to uh, and a commitment to, uh, to improve the condition of uh, peatlands wherever they are in Scotland. Obviously, we'll be looking for opportunities and then uh, I would certainly encourage stakeholders in those areas that do have land holdings where there are raised bogs uh, that they feel that could be could be helped to, to engage with SNH to engage with uh, Scottish government in identifying projects that we could take forward. So I'm, I'm happy to to kill that that myth if I can. That um, certainly we know there are clearly some major opportunity sites in the north and west of Scotland, but that's not to the exclusivity mm -hmm. uh, you know, of, of that region. And there are clearly uh, very good opportunities to improve the condition of, of bogs in the south, uh, central bell, and indeed other regions of Scotland. Thank you. Alex Jeez. Ferguson. Just on the back of that, very briefly, um, Minister, good morning, gentlemen. Um, certainly in my constituency, one of the major landowners that's had a major, an impact on uh, these bogs um, is the Forestry Commission. And um, you will be aware of the extent of forestry throughout uh, Dumfries and Galloway. And I just wondered whether you could comment on what talks, if any, have taken place with the Forestry Commission to when they're replanting to restore some of these bogs where appropriate. Well, uh, well, indeed. I mean, it's one of the things that's, that's come out recent FOIs uh, around the replanting in relation to forestry assets when we've either. Uh, had clearance of, of forestry and, and the approach that's taken. We are trying to develop a more modern approach to delivery of forestry uh, and, and to identify opportunities where there are um, uh, basically locations where we could, could do with leaving the landscape open uh, and to try and improve the degraded uh, peatland where there's maybe been tree planting on shallow shallow peatland or, or, or elsewhere. So it's certainly something that Forestry Commission, I know, do look at when they're designing uh, forestry schemes now where there are uh, uh, acquisitions as well, where we buy for, uh, assets for, for planting. We look to make sure that we take into account the condition of peatlands and, and work with that rather than try and work against peatland in those areas. So happy to come back to the committee with further detail, but um, it, it's certainly something I know Forestry Commission do factor into their thinking and uh, it's something that they know is a high priority for the government in terms of RPP2. Uh, it helps, obviously, with uh, the Director of Natural Resources, Bob McIntosh, having uh, responsibility in both areas. So he's, he's very well aware of it and from the top down uh, has, has managed to sort of percolate that message to both Forestry Commission and other aspects of the natural resources portfolio. Thank you. Uh, just to further up, uh, follow up, question. The idea of the carbon calculation about uh, wind farms is something which is a, an improving science, I guess. Um, I understand that SNH is going to add uh, concerns about the carbon impact of the import of uh, parts for, for uh, these in the carbon calculator, not just for peatland, but obviously for carrying the parts to the place where they're used. Um, would you say that, uh, that that should be extended from uh, large wind farms to those under 50 megawatts? Yes, we, we would encourage its use because in any planning decision, of course, you want a full understanding of the environmental impact of the decision that you're taking. And when it comes to peatland, uh, there might be a trade-off. If you take, a, 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 you know, for example, a, a wind turbine, you'd look at the, the loss of, um, of peatland and, and then try and determine what the payback period is in terms of carbon emissions and so on. So we would encourage the, the ever more scientific tools that help inform decisions to be rolled out, not just on scale, but to, to, you know, to NSI's. And you know, there's more work uh, being undertaken on that. So of course we would encourage best practice to be used. Um, to come back to the question of the maps, it's clear to me that when uh, people are actually doing specific surveys uh, on the ground, for example, uh, firms seeking to develop uh, wind farms, they get a far more accurate picture of what the actual depths of peat are, because they are the most accurate and uh, local investigations, which are not reflected necessarily on a map of this sort. So we can understand why that hasn't happened. Um, are there ways in which we can gather the environmental impact assessment uh, materials from commercial developments to add to our detailed understanding about the depths of peat that we're dealing with? I mean, one thing I can say, convener. I mean, the project level sort of environmental assessment. You're, you're absolutely right. Um, has the gives us the opportunity to collect that kind of 
information. Um, and we do sort of uh, expect a project level of environmental assessment of wind farm development should identify emissions rising from specific proposals. Uh, and this should be taken to, into account in decision making. So that does offer the opportunity to capture that information. Uh, uh, you know, we can obviously have a discussion um, uh, between us as to how best that could be achieved. But uh, to take on board the point you make about trying to use local information to further inform uh, what we're doing, uh, that, that because information being presented in the planning process, it's an opportunity for, for government or, or SNH and other stakeholders to collect that information and uh, to use it to good effect. Thank you for that. We've uh, got it on the record. We can have a look at in due course when we're thinking about our report. Can we move on to the subject of waste, please? Uh, Dick Lyle, kick off. Yes, good morning, uh, Ministers. Um, national waste, uh, national zero waste policy actually straddled between both your departments. Um, I've actually got two questions uh, in regard to waste, and, and we all know you can either bury it, recycle it, or burn it. And I think I'll cover the, the, the first two first. Um, CEPA and Glasgow City Council suggest NF, NPF3 could better reflect the importance of delivering a zero waste. In fact, CEPA uh, have went out and suggested that NPF3 could provide stronger po uh, policy support for delivery of zero waste by outlining in a national spatial context the Scottish Government's expectations for the planning system to support sustainable waste management and resource efficiency. We have 32 councils who are doing 32 different ways of treating waste. Some people are collecting uh, plastic bottles with the tops on. Some are saying you've got to take the tops off. Um, people, uh, companies, I believe, like Coca-Cola, are saying, no, we could take all these um, uh, items and, and recycle them. So could the, both the ministers explain how NPF3 supports the delivery of Scotland's zero waste commitments. I'm happy to pick that up. First of all, Convener, I think it's a good uh, question that uh, uh, Mr Lyles uh, presented. I, I would slightly um, challenge, though, um, the understanding uh, from the contributors of uh, the purpose of MPF3. It is a spatial expression of the government's strategy, and I think it would be wholly wrong for us to say and here are the sites we propose to put, for example, waste to energy plants, because that wouldn't be for us to determine centrally uh, in this fashion in a planning document uh, to do it in that way. So I think the spatial understanding is really important here that uh, to try and propose individual sites for that type of function would not be appropriate for this. However, that said clearly uh, within the climate change targets and, and how we deal with waste that are principles and policies that the government supports, and, uh, and Mr Wheelhouse can cover uh, some of them. But uh, to Mr Lyle's point, you know, as a former councillor, you'd be well aware of the lack of uh, a joint approach on this, which I do think there's great uh, potential to have shared services and working on this, so there's collaboration around the waste agenda, so that there's not at least 32 different approaches to how we deal with waste across uh, the country. I think there are better ways of delivering that, and that's something we would do in partnership with local government, but not necessarily something that would feature in MPF3. But in terms of Scottish planning policy, I think we are clear on the, the waste approach uh, for the country and the uh, zero waste strategy and uh, the kind of uh, decisions it would make. But for the reasons I've given, and I hope I've given enough uh, assurance why it's not the case, that it's appropriate to put it in a spatial uh, expression. If I could. Add to that, uh, convener. Uh, certainly, uh, in regards to the point that was made about SEPA's comments, if I can address that, uh, the point that was raised by Mr Lyle, um, certainly acknowledge that that was a point that was made by SEPA, but it's also worth pointing out that SEPA themselves have acknowledged uh, that further work would be needed to identify what is required to do what they suggested in terms of their evidence to the committee, uh, and we cannot define that in NPF3 for, for many of the reasons that Mr Mackay has just given. Uh, but it's also worth uh, saying that... Um, uh, there is ongoing work separately from NPF3, as I'm sure Mr Lyle will be aware, in part of the Cabinet Secretary, also uh, Mr Swinney and, and Mr Mackay indeed, looking at trying to work with local government to ensure that we do address the issue that was raised about the uh, different systems that are deployed and try and work to a point where we have a greater opportunity to develop our circular economy, as it's known, so we can actually take those recyclates, improve the quality of the recyclates and consistency of the material that's coming forward. Um, and ensure that we process that in Scotland rather than losing the value 
of those raw materials that are now leaving the country to uh, be reprocessed in other parts of the world where we have little control over what happens to them and we lose the opportunity to capture the value. So it's with the goal in mind of having a more circular economy and making more use of these, uh, this important resource that is produced through our waste system um, that uh, the Cabinet Secretary and fellow ministers such as Mr Mackay and Mr Swinney are working with local government to identify how best we can square that circle and make sure we get a greater consistency of product coming forward and develop the associated industries in Scotland that could then reprocess, <coughs> reprocess that material and generate jobs and value for our economy rather than somewhere else. As I said earlier, um, two questions. You know, waste, you can bury it, recycle it or burn it. The point that uh, Mr Mackay just made a minute ago, I, it was my understanding that the Scottish Executive in the first Parliament actually had designated sites, but, but that sort of disappeared off the, the horizon, uh, was put in the back, dare I say, back burner. Um, but I had an interesting, there's an interesting uh, submission from WWF Scotland, and if I come on to the burn it sort of category, and I hope I don't stray into someone else's question. Uh, to date, district heating has progressed in Scotland in an ad hoc way, driven forward by committed individuals, supported in part, and I must pay tribute to the Scottish Government District Heating Loan Fund. But NPF3 provides a valuable opportunity to establish a strategic national support for this trans transformational infrastructure. So its omission, its omission in the proposed framework is disappointed disappointing. So why shouldn't we have a national plan or a national designated sites? I know there will be NIMBY, not in my backyard, and people uh, have concerns about that. But why shouldn't we try and develop this form of resource which could provide uh, a new industry for Scotland? Uh, convener, I've got good news to the hitherto disappointed then uh, in the lack of such a strategy. In point 11 in the action plan, representing what's in the content of MPA3. We will publish a Scotland heat map in 2014 and work with local partners to produce a map for each local authority area. So I think this issue has moved on. I think we've got more information around it. And there is greater potential to connect uh, the source uh, of energy uh, with consumers for it. And we'll undertake more work to ensure that that happens this year. And hopefully that uh, encourages those who were, as I say, disappointed that we hadn't gone far enough. It's one of the key actions from this document. Oh. I, I knew about that. I just wanted to draw it out of you. I'm sure you did. <laughs> <laughs> um, Claudia Beamish. Uh. Right, thank you, convener. Um, if, if we could focus on um, supporting low-carbon development patterns, and that's been touched on in terms of, um, uh, of answers that you've both given about wind farms, but um, more broadly, uh, you've already mentioned the, the space tool and um, in oral evidence to the committee, Paula Charleston from SEPA suggested that um, we do have a tool and that she thinks that MPA, MPF3 could go further and suggest that a carbon assessment um, should be conducted for all developments so that people have an understanding of their impacts. And um, as you will both know, Minister, space allows for options, appraisals in the siting of housing, industrial developments and so on. And... Um, Paula Charleston says, I do not think that MPF3 is strong enough on this. Uh, so um, could um, the ministers uh, tell us um, if it could be strengthened to better allow low carbon developments by requiring carbon assessments to be conducted for all major developments or <coughs> indeed requiring local authorities to consider how their development plans support emission reduction targets? Because this is obviously very important in terms of rural living as well, and our, our connected places and the ways in which they're connected and, and that. Yep, I'll make two points uh, then. First of all, in, in, any major de in any development, in fact, there has to be a proportionate uh, assessment undertaken on environmental uh, impact. Now, for some, it may not be in the scale where that's required in any great detail, but for major, and you mentioned uh, major developments, there would be an expectation there would be an environmental impact and whatever um, assessments are relevant uh, uh, to that application. So I would say that there is uh, currently an assessment of, of impact on the environment. And then secondly, there's the um, uh, expectation around any development, for example, on uh, building standards. So if there's house building, 
um, not only would there be the, 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 the assessments, there's the expectation that properties would be built to a, a certain standard that we as government, and indeed Parliament, has said it should be uh, delivered. And within those targets, there's already been great progress in terms of a reduction in emissions. So there's the current standards that we require to be set and delivered upon in a statutory way. Then in terms of any new development, there's an assessment. Uh, but I've been very keen within the planning system to make sure it performs effectively. Uh, we get improved performance, but it's proportionate and fair in terms of the assessments. But anything on scale, I would, there'd be an expectation that there'd be that due process and that uh, environmental um, uh, assessment. And where there's, where there's that even more specific environmental understanding, such as you referenced earlier on peatlands, then there's a very specific way of assessing the impacts there. Um, thank you. Through, through the convener, could I ask you, Minister, then, about um, whether you would support the requirement for local development plans to put forward um, some sort of assessment about how they are supporting low carbon um, living and... and uh, my, my, my understanding is, in terms of the local development plans, that's already required in terms of statutory provisions. So we would already have to be produce that as per law. So that wouldn't be a new requirement. That burden's already there in terms of local development plans. But again, the unknown quantity here is which applications come forward. So we say all the plans we like in the world and all the land designations we like in the world. But what we don't have in our gift is the applications that come forward and therefore the overall um, impact. But the trajectory this document strategy takes is, is on downward um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions and that transformation to the low-carbon economy through transport, energy, uh, housing, proximity of new development and, and a host of other policies such as reforestation and, and other areas that Mr Wheelhouse is more of an expert on. <laughs> Set me up for a fall there. Um, <laughs> if I may add, Camille, I think just, just from, from the environment portfolio and from the point of view of, of, of how I feel NPF3 can help, Mr Mackay has alluded to it in, in, in a number of references, but the fact that we all know that one of the biggest challenges, in fact two of the biggest challenges we face are residential and transport emissions. And clearly uh, using NPA3 and obviously Scottish planning uh, policy as well to uh, steer developments in terms of thinking their design, uh, that they design in uh, future-proof, if you like, for these issues such as ensuring that there are opportunities for sustainable active travel, there's opportunities for good public transport connections. There's opportunities for digital connection to avoid people having to travel in the first place. So all of these things through the planning system can influence um, our, our performance as a society in achieving our greenhouse gas emissions. So I see real opportunities in MPA3 and indeed in, in, in the new Scottish planning policy to achieve those kind of objectives uh, and certainly back up what Mr Mackay is saying about the uh, ability to use the system in terms of tackling the challenges in transport and housing. And just as a very brief supplementary to that, um, it has been highlighted in some evidence that there isn't any um, reference, uh, as far as I can see as well, to air pollution. And obviously, um, in relation to planning, that's, that's a very important issue. Certainly. Um, I don't know whether there's any other questions in air quality, convener, but uh, clearly um, there's... All oh, right. Well, I'll just say, I'm happy to come, up, come back to that, but certainly there's quite strong linkages to um, how local authorities manage your quality management areas and, and we can deal with that at the appropriate time with us. We need to come back at that point. Not at all, that's Grant. Um, wind farm developments and wild land. Alec Ferguson. Um, thank you, Convener. Um, in his opening uh, remarks to the committee, uh, Mr Wheelhouse said, and I'm paraphrasing, I think, but in, in taking forward sustainable economic development, it's very important that we continue to protect our rural landscape and countryside, and I don't think any of us would disagree with that. Um, and I, I just wanted to touch briefly, if I may, on the government's um, thinking on the work that was commissioned through SNH to identify the core areas of wild land, um, a, a work that I think has achieved international recognition for its quality. Um, it was included in the MIR, the Main Issues Report. Uh, it was given quite a... a, a high status in, in SPP, um, and there, uh, as some witnesses drew our attention to in previous meetings, um, there is a bewilderment amongst some uh, as to why, rather like the map of peatland depth that we were talking about earlier on, as to why this has not been included in NPF3, and I just wondered whether the Minister could enlighten me on that. 
Well, if, if I could uh, invite Mr Mackay to talk about the, uh, the, the coverage of MPF3, and I'm then happy to talk about um, what SNH are doing in terms of the world line maps, if that would make sense to Too keen to split try it in a question that only one of you might answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope I give you. <laughs> Failed again. Yeah, well, I, I'm sure I'll give you a satisfactory answer, and if I don't, <laughs> Mr Wheelhouse will cover the rest. Um, <laughs> in, in terms of wild land, there was great debate uh, in other committees. This is, this is my fourth committee appearance on, on MPF3. Uh, Wild land has generated a great deal of in interest, and of course, for, for the purposes of clarity, by wild land we mean in relation uh, to, to wind developments and turbines. Some people have got uh, uh, another idea that we meant a wider designation than that, it's as it relates uh, to wind turbines. And the reason it doesn't feature in the current iteration is uh, that SNHR, of course, as you refer to, conducting a consultation exercise on their analysis and their map. Therefore, it would have been wrong to prejudice that and put it in this uh, document. It was in the main issues report. Some of it will relate, and the second reason is, some of it will relate to Scottish planning policy, and some of it relates to MPF3 in terms of the spatial expression. So, however we take that work forward, it would appear more appropriate through Scottish planning policy, and therefore le it's less of a feature in MPF3. But the ambitions are still the same, and the ambitions were around affording greater protection to, to parts of the country where we felt that that was required. And that's not to say development can't go ahead. Indeed, you can develop the most protected part of Scotland as long as you do it in a way that it can be fully mitigated and protect the environment. It can still be developed in a sustainable way, a natural site, for, it, for example, as long as you meet certain criteria. So what we've proposed and what we're working on in, in terms of um, the uh, renewable sector as it relates to wind, there's a categorisation that says in some parts of the country it's simply a no-go, it's a ban. The national parks and the national scenic areas. And then we proposed a further category around areas um, of, for example, uh, wild land, and they're referred to in reference to in the SNH uh, maps, where siting, design and mitigation can, uh, uh, can overcome significant effects of the quality of the area. So that's greater protection not a ban, but not a free-for-all, so to speak. And so we're still uh, working on that. We'll look forward to the analysis of the SNH work, and then we'll arrive at a final position. So to those who think that wildland's no longer an issue because it doesn't feature in here, it is still an issue. We are still engaging on it, and we'll produce our final position before the end of this process. And by the end of the process, uh, I mean for the conclusion of Scottish Planning Policy Review, which is of June 2014, which I recognise... Uh, is out with the formal 60-day parliamentary scrutiny period here, uh, but it will be concluded by the end of June. Uh, and, of course, uh, by that point, uh, MPF3 will have, have been to Parliament or will, will be in the floor of Parliament with, with your recommendations. So um, that's why it doesn't feature, but the work around greater protection whilst uh, keeping with our renewables targets, uh, that work continues. Similarly, just, just for completeness, there were questions in other committees around, for example, separation distance as well. We had consulted on uh, 2.5 kilometres of a separation distance. And again, there, was, there were mixed views around that as well. And that's another matter that we'll have to conclude by the end of the process. So too, there was a question on, and I'm offering you areas to probe now, which might not be wise, but uh, for completeness, uh, the definition of a wind farm. Because depending on which document or which policy you're looking at, or which uh, planning authority, there might be a different definition. And we're looking at it would be better to have one singular definition as well in that final document. So all of these matters will be clarified. And I greatly appreciate the input of the committee into, into that current thinking. But it would have been wrong for us to come today with a final position whilst those uh, consultations are still ongoing. I really, I'll really, i try and keep it brief because you almost, you almost got away with one question. Um, I, I suppose just the things to emphasise, because uh, I know there have been some concerns raised by other groups like the Crofters uh, in relation to uh, the uh, proposals regarding wild land and this misinterpretation on the part of many, um, it would appear, maybe guided by the media rather than by, by anything in Parliament, that there is a designation of wild land. And that is not uh, what is happening. As Mr Mackay has said, this is primarily a measure aimed to address concerns about wind farms. Uh, other forms of development will still uh, be possible in these areas. And even as Mr Mackay said, in, in areas that are covered in the wild land map, it's still possible for renewable projects to happen if they can be mitigated in terms of their landscape impact and, uh, and, and other impacts. So just, just to make that point and uh, just to reassure those 
um, stakeholders. I know the, the uh, Western Isles uh, Council, uh, Kimberley and Nani um, are, were concerned about um, the, uh, the, the implications for development, wider development in their area. And just to nail that one, it's not a designation we're talking about. And development can still happen, because as we say, we want to make rural Scotland a vibrant mm. uh, place to live, work and, and enjoy. I think if I may just very briefly, I, I, I'm absolutely aware that it's not a designation, but I think it's important to get that on the record. Um, I, I think the concern was that having done a great deal of work to, to that the, the SNH have done in producing this document and this map, it was going to somehow lie on the shelf. And I think there is, uh, I think the replies that we've had would indicate that that is certainly not the case and that this has a part to play in future planning policy. So if thank can, you. If I can thank, uh, give you to thank uh, Mr. Ferguson for his co comments about SNH's work. I appreciate the uh, sincerity of them. And, and it is, I think, uh, a very difficult task they have in terms of trying to take something that's very subjective and put into. Uh, into a map form uh, where wildland is, and uh, you know we will obviously, both myself, Mr. Mackay, and, and other ministers will uh, be looking forward to, to seeing what advice they give us in terms of the the map. I, I should, should say a final point. We, we touched on the maps earlier, but even more important than maps and illustrations it is criteria, and, and the question uh, to, to any development is: uh, do you get the right development in the right places? And irrespective of something's in or out of a map will be, um, does it meet the criteria and, and can the environmental impact be, uh, be mitigated to the extent that it's overcome and that would be important wherever the, the development happens to feature. But no part, no part of Scotland will be declared dead by this government. Every part uh, should be uh, alive to sustainable development. MD. Uh, thank you. I, I want to take, uh, thank the Minister for opening the door to talking about certain other aspects of planning policies that relate to wind farms. He, he touched there upon it, increasing the buffer zone potentially, or uh, the separation zone from wind farms from 2 to 2.5 kilometres. But in that context, I think it's important to explore, and not necessarily today, the, where the, the, the buffer zone would, would be from. I mean, if we're talking about settlements and we're talking about villages, we need to get a definition of, of what that would be. I mean, a cluster, would a cluster of houses count as a settlement and then therefore be relevant to it? And all, on the same context, in a rural setting, it strikes me as preposterous that we have this 20 metre neighbour notice uh, distance when in a, a rural setting it's a completely different environment. And I wonder if that might be explored. But the main point I want to get to is uh, what's been raised in evidence both by Friends of the Earth and the Badenoch and Strathspey Conservation Group in relation to the possibility of a third-party right of appeal with an environmental uh, tribunal to hear such appeals. I'm wondering if the government will consider that in order to bring a better and fairer balance to this whole process, accepting that it could create certain difficulties with perhaps self-appointed anti-wind farm groups you know, get involved in the process with every single application. I realise there's a series of questions in there, but I just wanted to get that out there. Yeah, very, very substantial questions that could take some time to um, uh, uh, debate fully. Uh, so I'll cut straight to the answer on your third question on third party right of appeal. No, the government has no proposals to consider third party right of appeal. Parliament's uh, previously uh, debated that, and we now have a planning act that I think broadly has settled down fairly well. Uh, so the government um, <coughs> will not progress at such an option because actually we would much rather front load uh, engagement in the planning system and have better engagement at the start, both at pre application consultation and the creation of uh, development plans, indeed, in the creation of areas of search. So we would rather have it the other way about, that rather than have the public become objectors and appellants at the end, that they better engage at the start of the planning process. And, and that's very much a feature of much of the uh, work that we've tried to undertake. I've also put a great deal of emphasis in trying to get the planning system to move more quickly. Now, quality counts, getting the right uh, developments in the right places is uh, paramount. But frankly, it takes too long for planning applications to go through the system. That's not always the fault of the planning authority. I should say there can be a range of indicators. And I think if there was a further right of appeal, then that would prolong the planning system to an extent that I think, frankly, would probably deter investment and, and deter uh, some developments uh, completely. So the right decision should be taken with um, all the appropriate considerations taken on board. So hopefully that answers your point and the rationale why we're not proceeding with a party right of appeal. On the 
um, issue of separation distance. Uh, definitions, as I've found in my two-year now exposure to planning as minister, can be everything. And the definition we proposed was distance from a settlement as per the local development plan, uh, because that's a pretty settled view on what, what is a, a development, a town or a village, and so on. But you see, there are unintended consequences from what we were proposing of a 2.5k separation distance as per that policy. For example, when I visited the Western Isles, which many are keen in, uh, in those islands to, to see development as a way of uh, leveraging in resource and, and, and sustaining the local economies and community ownership and community benefit and so on, the impact of the policy might have been there were very few areas that could have been developed by turbines at all, contrary to maybe what local communities actually wanted. Now, I think it would be wrong for us to create such policies in Edinburgh that had a disproportionate effect in other parts of the country. So, I think the policy approach has to be far more sensitive. And for that reason and other reasons, we commissioned work into separation distance to get an evidence-based uh, methodology around what's more appropriate. Because 2.5k of a separation distance might be appropriate for some in terms of landscape, but it might not be appropriate for others for landscape or other environmental reasons. So, again, we've consulted on that. We're, we're undertaking uh, the expert research and will produce a final position for the end of Scottish planning policy where it would more accurately fit. But crucially, it must be sensitive to local circumstances rather than an arbitrary figure. Now, it's roughly at 2k at the moment in terms of separation, but it feels more appropriate to us that it's part of development management rather than lines on a map, as we've discussed uh, earlier. But we want uh, local communities to be protected to landscape surveys to, to understand that uh, and whatever we do to be evidence-based. So much work is, is uh, to be done in terms of the separation distance and uh, uh, the, the definition of what a settlement is, but we, we relied quite heavily on the local development plan. So I think that was the two key points that Mr Day was raising. If I may, Minister, then, taking on board your point, you talked about front-loading this and encouraging engagement at the initial stage. If people aren't actually necessarily being advised of a proposal, as is happening in rural areas with this 20-metre rule, then they're not going to feel engaged in the process. So is that something that can be looked at for a rural setting? Well, I'm, I don't propose to look at the notification distances again as part of the planning system, but what we are doing is uh, partly in light of a, a petition that's made its way to the Scottish Parliament uh, around uh, set, uh, notification distances is rolling out good practice in terms of what developers could and should do to make others aware of development uh, in their areas. But I'm pretty convinced and content that the current notification process is fine because the correspondence I see suggests that it's not a big secret that uh, turbines uh, are being applied for and wind farms are being sought. But when a local authority or when a planning authority engages at the, at the outset on development plans, that, that should be a full public engagement exercise, um, publicised uh, widely, uh, engaging local community councillors and local stakeholders and others around what land use designation should look like. And I think it is unacceptable that too many local development plans are out of date. And when I say out of date, a local development plan should be less than five years old, and nearly half of development plans in the country are more than five years old. That's unacceptable, and that's why we've got a particular action plan to try and update them. But we do believe in front-loading the planning system with engagement. When it comes to notification, um, the die is almost cast in, in what, is, what is proposed at that that stage, so it's better if we engage um, earlier, and I would absolutely uh, encourage that. Uh, but in terms of your point around the notification distances, we've got no proposals to change them. That said, we have asked uh, developers, and I, I think it might, is it partners in SNH, to look at the best practice guidance on raising awareness around wind farm developments in a local area? I can provide more information if the committee wants, of course. Um, I want to prolong this uh, particular discussion a little longer. Um, uh, first of all, to correct the record, I don't have 13 of the proposed 40 uh, core wildland areas. I have 14 uh, and uh, in my constituency. Um, I, I'm very concerned because it's a huge postback that uh, we get the people who talk about the view from their window, the view from the top of the mountains, the, mu the view when driving towards the mountains, you know, uh, subjective perceptions. Uh, and uh, indeed, I know that you can't reflect these in the policy, but uh, how do we get uh, 
an interface with the overview that climate change and biodiversity, and indeed in areas such as I'm looking at on the core wildland map, were actually clearance areas and not wild land. Well, I mean, if I could start off, I don't know whether Mr. Mackay wants to come in as well, but uh, in terms of my opening remarks, I mean, uh, uh, I've certainly been struck by the degree to which people sometimes forget that the landscape that we see in front of us has been shaped by man to a large extent. And, uh, you know, sad to say, as a forestry minister talking about uh, deforestation at the beginning of the 20th century, down to sort of about 4% um, uh, tree cover in Scotland. So that shows you how far the landscape had been manipulated by man for, for agriculture and for other purposes and obviously we're trying to put that right over time. So there will be a number of different land use changes and, and obviously clearly um, yeah, the link between this document and, and land use is very important but I appreciate that's a different subject. But you know, we, we have to um, have an acceptance as a society that we're not looking at a, a land that is perhaps wild in, the, in, in an absolute sense but it's a relative measure of wildness that uh, SNH has been trying to map and for the, the reasons that Mr Mackay gave there's a number of criteria and sub subjectivity comes into it and so it's, it's obviously inherently a, a difficult exercise um, but they are doing a very good job of trying to pull that together but we do recognise there needs to be uh, an understanding in society that we need critical infrastructure whether it's schools or hospitals or social housing uh, we can't preserve the countryside in ASPIC there are clearly uh, key uh, natura sites and, and protective features that we have to look after, but that we can work in sensitivity to the environment and still achieve our objectives as a society to develop um, the resources that we, we need to, to, to develop to ensure the vibrancy of our rural communities. And so I, I do get concerned when I see some of the, the commentary about, uh, about uh, issues such as this that would seek to preserve Scotland in, in, in aspect and allow no uh, community development at all in areas, whether it's Caithness and Sutherland or the Western Isles or other parts of rural Scotland. And we need to be sensitive to the needs for those communities to, to have jobs and prosperity and to, uh, to, be, to be happy and, and healthy communities at the same time as doing what we can to, to make sure that major developments, which might have a, a significant impact on, on the landscape, are done and designed as sensitively as possible. And I'm confident at a local level that there are uh, you know, good sites come forward, there are bad sites come forward. The key is to make sure that the planning system uh, treats every application on its merits and where we can, if we can change the design of a project to have greater sympathy either to, from a biodiversity point of view to maybe to protect from bird impacts or from a landscape point of view to work more, with more sensitivity to the landscape, I'm sure we can do that. We've, we've got ample opportunity to do that within a country uh, like Scotland with the, the landscape that we have uh, to work with. Uh, convener, it would be, um, I don't know, uh, helpful if I said that nimbyism does exist in some parts of Scotland. Some people say I like wind farms, just don't cite them in my area. Um, that's just the reality. The planning system sometimes is about conflict. It's about balancing interests, and this is about balancing the, uh, the needs of the country and sometimes local environment. Not everyone who sees a wind turbine thinks they're a bad thing. Uh, not everyone um, who supports renewable energy is a fan of turbines. Not I know from our consultation exercise is that those, if we call them the wild land lobby, said we didn't go far enough in protection, and some developers felt we went too far. So it's for you to decide if we got the balance right, but we do propose growth of the renewables industry for good environmental reasons, but greater protection of some of the most scenic parts of our country. And we think we were able to outline uh, how we achieve this. And, and again, to be clear, in the categorisation that we propose, some parts of the country, the national parks, the national scenic areas were a ban. Other areas were afforded greater protection. And then there are other groupings where there are less constraints to uh, development. But I say again that no part of the country has been uh, declared dead to development. Everything is about a sensitive uh, um, methodology to, to balance interests, to reach the right conclusion, to get the right development uh, in the right uh, places. And you know, we'll, we'll be doing further work on this to arrive at a, at a policy position that's clear, because the last thing we want to do on wind and energy um, is to fudge the position of a lack of clarity um, uh, and clearly planning authorities will want that, so we'll publish new planning advice no notes coming from the policy changes as well. But we, we do seem to, if you pardon the pun, spend a lot of energy on uh, wind uh, energy when 
Um, there are great developments coming forward in terms of hydro and, of course, offshore developments as well. And that might change the, uh, the balance of, of developments across the country as we deliver on uh, those targets, a uh, white, uh, as I say, wave uh, and tidal, um, as well as other forms of, of energy um, uh, production. But I do think we can get the balance, uh, the balance uh, right and in terms of our own concerns around uh, wild uh, land. I think it would be wrong to suggest that that um, status is a barrier uh, to development. It is about a sensitive approach um, in these, these uh, areas. And, and we will get into a whole debate around buffer zones. And I can see a wind farm from the top of a mountain. Well, it is quite different from immediate visual <laughs> landscape impact from having you know, a, a wind turbine right before you. So, so this is very, this is a very subjective matter, but we you know, trust the planning authorities to take the guidance that we issue and apply it sensitively locally. But yes, the area most affected through this current approach would be uh, the Highland Council area, and that's why I was particularly keen to see the uh, advice from the head of planning, uh, Malcolm McLeod, there, uh, who who's been quite uh, well informed and, and how we take this forward. And in terms of that, it's also fortuitous that the Head of Planning in that Council is also the Head of Planning for Heads of Planning Scotland and can help advise us to ensure that we get the balance right. But I'm very mindful that there are vested interests in some of these responses. Uh, just before I bring in Paul Wheelhouse, uh, a small supplementary on this point. Um, because people want to have buffer zones, it leads them to suggest having more national parks because they're top-line designations. Uh, there are none proposed in this document. I take it that there will be none being considered for the next period of time. I'm happy to, to, to address that point. I mean, I've, I've met with uh, stakeholders who have uh, been campaigning for national parks and association protection in rural Scotland and, uh, and others. Uh, we have uh, made clear to them that there's no groundswell of support that I'm aware of. There are obviously individuals who have written to me uh, in my capacity as Minister responsible for national parks. Uh, and not uh, to diminish the, um, the campaigns of those two, two groups I mentioned, um, but we have not had a, a groundswell of support for new national parks. We do not have a clear view from those proposing new national parks of what they would actually be in terms of their business case and, and, their, and their, the, the setup of those national parks. So the, there is a lack of clarity about what is actually being requested, but we have certainly have no plans at this time to create new national parks. But if I may come back to a couple of points which I hope will be helpful, convener, rather than, uh, than, than, than dragging us down. Um, you mentioned climate change, and I think it is important to put on record. I mean, we, we obviously, for the reasons that were given earlier, we have a high degree of ambition on climate change for very uh, valid reasons, as I am sure the committee will identify with. Um, but let's not forget that climate change will have an impact on Scotland. It is already having an impact in terms of uh, resilience pressures on our country. It will have an impact on our biodiversity. It will have an impact on our landscape quality and, and potentially the kind of landscapes we see over time as we see significant changes in our climate. And uh, we should not lose sight of that. Uh, we're fighting. Uh, sometimes it seems a losing battle uh, to protect some of our species that are in, uh, in dire need of, of, of support, such as uh, capercaillie, ptarmigan, others that are being uh, kittiwakes that are being affected by, by climate change. Uh, but there are also uh, pressures in terms of our, our, our flora uh, as well, in terms of the uh, impact of, of changing climate. And just to say on, on renewable energy itself, we should also mention that the government has a target to have half a, a gigawatt of community um, energy projects in Scotland. And I think one of the ways in which we can work in greater sensitivity to community views on renewable energy is to promote community involvement, whether it's directly in owning or operating renewable energy projects or indeed through having an active shareholding uh, and genuine uh, community uh, investment in those wind uh, energy projects and other renewable projects. And that's a way in which we can work in sympathy with the, the views of local communities and, and, and challenge them to come forward with projects that suit them in terms of uh, sites that they believe are, are more appropriate for wind energy projects. So I think there's a number of different tacks we take, but let's not lose sight of the fact that climate change is real. It's affecting Scotland. We have our duty to do our bit on a global scale, but it also is protecting the landscapes and biodiversity that we value. And uh, that is why organisations like RSPB, uh, SWT and other uh, environmental charities are very much supportive of renewable in the right place. And I think we should, uh, we should look, look to that message. 
Thank you. Um, just to finish this section, I think Alec Ferguson wants a brief point. If, if I may convene, and thank you, because I, I, this is a subject that excites, um, I think is the right way to put it, a great many of my constituents. Um, and there's one issue relating to the planning process that, that they are always bringing up with me. And by the way, could I just draw attention to my register of interest in which it is stated that I do receive an income from a wind farm company. Um, the, the issue that gets a lot of my members excited, is, is, and I think Mr Mackay just said we put our trust in the local authorities. Um, and indeed, if I may specifically mention Dumfries and Galloway Council, they have introduced their own guidelines on siting of wind farms, which I think most people accept are pretty sensible um, for the region. What excites people particularly is when the local authority um, rejects an application based on its own guidelines, and that local authority then has, the, uh, sorry, the developer then has the right to appeal, and you know where I'm going with this, uh, and when that appeal is upheld, um, the, the, basically the, the, the well-intentioned guidance of the local authority is seen to be run roughshod over. And the question that we get asked, or I get asked a lot, is we have no right of appeal, third right of appeal, and I don't, I'm not going to argue with that. Why do they? And I just wonder if, as I'm, I'm sorry to prolong this, but I wonder if you could just almost advise me on how, how you would reply to that um, particular point. I think it's a very helpful question that Mr Ferguson's asked uh, on this because the uh, principle of a, uh, an appeal mechanism is well established in the planning policy for good reason for the uh, applicant to assure that the policies uh, deployed by uh, the government are indeed the, the local authority have been adhered to and I would uh, defend that. And in practice, and this is really important because this is another myth when it comes to wind farms in Scotland, now, I don't have the figures for Dumfries and Galloway, but I do have the figures for the whole of the country. The suggestion that the Scottish Government's reporters, independent, uh, you know, directly of ministerial decision, but the uh, decisions by reporters on appeal, that we are overturning decisions across the country, a majority of, is not the case. Actually, in terms of uh, all developments, and this is the case too for wind farm developments, a, a minority of local authority decisions are overturned by our reporters by the uh, Department for Planning and Environmental Appeals. So that gives me some reassurance that the system is working fairly well because it's only a minority. It's about a third of applications, incidentally, uh, roughly, that are being uh, overturned. So the majority of the time that local authority makes a determination, um, the, uh, uh, the, the government... Uh, uh, or sorry, a majority of the time that uh, an appeal is received, uh, the government is supportive um, of the local authority. And when it's section 36 applications, so that's decisions made by uh, reporters uh, for, for the larger uh, wind farms. And a majority of occasions, the local authority agrees with us. So that actually gives us quite a strong message and narrative that we're not overturning decisions across the country. Uh, but where they're appealed, where they are overturned, uh, overturned, it would be on the basis of, of policy considerations. So if there's to be an appeals mechanism, it should be independent. It is of the planning authority, and it's not the case that we're overturning decisions across the country. So that gives me some assurance that the process is working fairly well. But that won't keep everybody happy if their objection or their um, uh, local area has been subject to a decision that they don't like. I accept the explanation. Just, may I just put on record, I, do, I was not accusing the government of overturning every appeal. Oh, oh sorry. Not everyone is as reasonable came, as you, though, Mr Ferguson. No, that is very true, <laughs> Mr Mackay. Um, but but I, I know time is against us, so I won't prolong this. But it, it is an issue that, that does concern a number of constituents. Yeah, I, I appreciate ask. the explanation. Could I ask the Minister just to give us a breakdown in the last four or five years of that? It may well be in parliamentary answers, but it would be very helpful indeed. Happy to share that, yeah. share that, that with, with my. I would make one point, though. It's quite important. And I, I can't remember if it was Dumfries and Galloway, to be fair, but a couple of councils had asked for a moratorium on wind farm developments in their areas. And just government does not support that position because a moratorium on any kind of development would be unhelpful because it just puts off the kind of decisions you would need to take uh, at some point uh, further down the line. But what we were able to do to support planning authorities is put in a one-off investment to the tune of some £725,000 to assist planning authorities in, in uh, making determinations and giving them the, the tools to do the job. And uh, therefore, we don't support the, the moratorium. So planning authorities, politicians, might not always be uh, too keen to take decisions in their call for moratorium. 
Thank you. Um, we'll move on to national developments, and uh, Cara Hilton is going to kick off here. Yes. Um, just for both ministers, um, during our evidence sessions, um, Scottish Environment Link pointed out that some of the uh, national developments could be contrary to the government's um, climate change goals. Um, how well would you say that the list of national developments reflects the government's priority of securing a low carbon place? And do some of the proposals risk increasing Scotland's climate emissions, carbon emissions even? Okay. Yeah. I, I mean, I think, I think it's a, a good question. And uh, some developments individually may increase uh, emissions, but will be offset by the overall approach of the policy. So by decarbonisation of transport, by uh, reduced emissions through energy, for example, then we should be bringing the emissions down. That said, depending on the development around road infrastructure, potentially, although we you know, propose decarbonisation and greater electrification, um, but um, airports and some other developments might contribute to, to, to climate emissions, to, 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 to gas emissions and so on. But overall, the trajectory will, will be a downward one, and we hope we've got the balance right. And I just use aviation as an example because it's who the environmental lobby would turn to fairly quickly. But we do believe that you know, airports are key dynamos for, for the economy and, uh, and therefore they're, they're to be supporting there's greater progress in the aviation industry in any event around emissions too. So I simply use that to make the point. Not every development will reduce emissions all the way we would want it to, but the overall package uh, should be along those lines because of the, the kind of strategies that we would deploy. Not, not least, for example, around, you know, uh, location of settlements or active travel approaches or the Central Scotland uh, Green Network are other examples where we would expect uh, emissions to be uh, reduced. So, so it is about a balance uh, going over and above the, the areas we discussed earlier, such as energy transport and housing and uh, reforestation, which I think we covered at some uh, length earlier on. So can I ask a wee quick supplementary? You talked about decarbonisation of transport and the evidence that we've received um, from Stop Climate Chaos. Uh, they say that the government's overall transport strategy is um, inconsistent with the decarbonisation of the transport network. I take it you would disagree with their view? I think that there's a debate to be had there, but if we propose you know, future, future greater use of, of electric cars, for example, building a road is not necessarily a bad thing if we're saying there'll be electric rather than using fossil fuels, for example, or greater use of the railways is also, again, using electricity from renewable resources. I think if you bring it all together, yes, I would um, I disagree with that, that um, general black and white comment that it doesn't go far enough. If you put it all together, then I think it shows that road building is not in itself necessarily a bad thing, especially when it might be addressing uh, congestion as well and having greater, more um, effective uh, use of our transport system. So it's all about uh, a balance, and I think we've got the balance right. I think, I think if I can maybe add to that, I mean, the discussions that uh, both Mr Brown and myself have had with Stop Climate Chaos and uh, Transform Scotland in terms of uh, you know, sustainable active travel discussions. Uh, there are key projects which are being developed, such as the A9, where we'll be looking to establish uh, long-distance cycle routes along the route to make sure that we use the opportunity where we've got the uh, construction work going on to facilitate that additional infrastructure. Um, clearly, uh, when it comes to, uh, as Mr Mackay has alluded to, there comes down to choices. We, we, I, I very much respect the view of Stop Climate Chaos. who would like us to go down a different route in terms of our strategy to lower uh, carbon emissions and transport. I would rather have us have demand management rather than looking at alternative technologies and alternative fuels. We have taken a decision uh, as, as the government in terms of RPP2 to deliver um, a, a strategy which looks at decarbonisation of our vehicle fleet and the, uh, the fuels that are used in that vehicle fleet to ensure that we have uh, lower emissions from transport through that route. So developing electric and hybrid vehicles, putting in place the charging infrastructure are things that are already in place. And the ECOS uh, group, which is a partnership, uh, has developed a strategy, a route map, to get us to that decarbonisation target for, for transport. So we are doing things in parallel. It, it, for the reason we gave earlier on, it's not necessarily reflected mm. in NPF3, because these are parallel documents. But 
uh, I suppose, take, take it from what I'm saying, that uh, we've placed a very great uh, store in trying to do something quite significant in terms of tackling our climate emissions and transport. As I'm very much aware through the RPP2 process, as, as, as uh, Ms Beamish will, will, will appreciate from the time, that transport and housing are the two areas where perhaps we've got the biggest challenge as a society, and that's one that's replicated across Western Europe uh, in terms of areas that uh, countries to varying degrees have done more or less in this area, but the, there's a pretty consistent picture that that's the area where the challenge is greatest, uh, because it relies on massively on behavioural change. So we, all we can do is try and put in place the infrastructure uh, that, will, that will help people make soon, but ultimately we also have to do work on behavioural change uh, to make it work effectively. That's fine. Um, and it's supplementary from Angus MacDonald. Yeah, uh, thanks, Convener. Good morning, Ministers. Um, following on from uh, Cara Hilton's point, um, as she alluded to, uh, we've heard some evidence in committee regarding uh, the list of national developments and a possible knock-on effect uh, of increasing uh, Scotland's climate emissions. However, we also heard support for many of the national developments, including uh, support from SNH and Glasgow City Council for the Metropolitan Glasgow Strategic Drainage Partnership. Um, from our Gowan Butte Council supported the inclusion of pump storage hydro and better rec recognition for active travel. And Scottish Environment Link uh, welcomed the continued attention of the Central Scotland Green Network, uh, as the Minister uh, has alluded to. Um, CEPA also noted that NPF3 will support the delivery of uh, RPP2 emission reduction actions in the energy sector, uh, including carbon capture and storage. Um, so, specifically, with regard to carbon capture and storage, if you'll excuse me, uh, as a committee, excuse me for being parochial, um, as you know, uh, one of the proposed CCS plants is in my constituency of Falkirk East uh, as part of the Grangemouth Investment Plan, which is in the uh, National Development List. Uh, now, there are some local concerns uh, which have been raised regarding the impact on air quality if 90 per cent carbon capture is not operational from day one at the plant. Uh, and clearly, any planning application like this has to take into account environmental considerations. However, uh, notwithstanding that, can the ministers reassure me and my constituents that environmental safeguards in terms of air quality will be given due consideration uh, if or when the application is submitted for Grangemouth and also for uh, Peterhead. I'm happy to, to take that in, Convener. Um, the first thing to say is that the, uh, the SEA for, for a project like that will, uh, will acknowledge the potential for impacts on air quality, and there's quite strict regulation through the um, EC Industrial Emissions Directive, uh, which would, obviously SEPA would have the responsibility to, to enforce. Mm. Uh, so there would be, you know, obviously, if, if a site like that was was to be developed um, as a national development, there would be uh, ongoing and uh, rigorous uh, policing of the emissions from from the site to make sure that they were consistent with the requirements of the uh, EC and, uh, Industrial Emissions Directive. Um, a project level environmental impact assessment as well uh, would also provide more detailed assessment of impacts taking into account a range of factors that might be uh, found in a site like that, including um, uh, fuel transport, fuel technology used, uh, mitigation measures that might be developed uh, and identified to ensure the impacts are reduced to an acceptable level. And we have explicitly acknowledged in the case of, of Grangemouth uh, and the need for coordinated um, action uh, to address the potential impacts of the development on the quality of life of the local community. And planning, in this instance, has a key role uh, to play in ensuring the quality of place and, and, and the environment uh, that people live within. And we will uh, take this forward for, following the finalisation of the MPF3 uh, and as part of the action programme. So I, I'm happy to obviously have a, a, a more detailed discussion with, with Mr MacDonald about his concerns as constituents, but put on record that we would see foresee SEPA taking um, you know, a rigorous approach in terms of making sure that the EC Industrial Emission Directive is applied, working with the operators of the site. Obviously, the general approach that SEPA takes is to work with businesses to make sure they comply rather than have to deal with the aftermath of a non-compliance issue, and uh, that the, hopefully the project-level EIA will give us the sufficient detail to understand where the particular problems might arise and tackle them ahead of 
of the development taking place, but I don't know if Mr Mackay wants to add to that. I, I, I think Mr uh, Wheelhouse has adequately covered the safeguards, and I heard him say on his head, be it. So um, <laughs> that covers the planning system. Sure uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think Thank that covers Mackay. the planning system as well. I think it's an important, very serious point to make, that this, this is not retrospective. This is not just about monitoring and, and enforcement and regulation. This is about making sure we get the development right at the outset before any development goes ahead. I think that's why there are such uh, stringent uh, regulations and expectations around the assessment that would be made, both for it to feature as a, a national development and then to be developed uh, in due course if the, if the funding package and the development proposal comes together. But we are mindful of the engagement we've had uh, in that area. That's why we had specific engagement, not just the uh, general uh, MPF uh, free a consultation exercise we had across the country, but we had very specific engagement with that community to make sure we understood the issues that had been raised and how we might address them. So I would like to <clears throat> concur with Mr Wheelhouse in, in addressing Mr Macdonald's comments that absolutely local uh, community and mitigation of environmental impact uh, and local interests will, will be crucial in taking this uh, forward very much as part of the overall approach on sustainable economic uh, development. Thanks, um, Convener. I certainly welcome the assurances from uh, both the Ministers um, as well as uh, my constituents. Um, if I could continue being a parochial Convener, um, there is also uh, an issue in my constituency with regard to the issue of unconventional gas extraction, uh, which does not get as warm a welcome in NPF 3 as it did in NPF 2. Uh, now, while it is not a, a national development, it will have a major impact uh, in the proposed areas should it go ahead, and clearly there are some concerns, uh, growing concerns, uh, not least in uh, my Falkirk East constituency, regarding the, the gung-ho attitude of the UK government uh, issuing pedal licences left, right and centre, uh, and the imminent release of even more pedal licences in the, the near future. Now, um, I welcomed the Minister's announcement last October on the introduction of buffer zones uh, between unconventional gas developments and communities. However, this is clearly a, a complex issue, and SEPA have recently confirmed uh, they may not have the capacity to monitor, monitor um, any methane leakage from the wells uh, properly. So clearly, there are a number of environmental concerns, both locally and nationally. Uh, in addition, Scottish Environment Link in their submission called on the government to invoke the precautionary principle in relation to coal bed methane and not allow any developments to occur under uh, any developments to occur until climate, environmental and health concerns are fully addressed. So I am um, hoping to take the opportunity to ask the Ministers uh, if um, they can give the Committee and the wider public some comfort that should unconventional gas extraction go ahead, uh, SEPA will have appropriate powers and capacity to regulate it. Uh, and also can you confirm that local planning authorities will have the power to set the distance of each buffer zone, uh, which um, the Minister announced in October. If I could take the first part and maybe direct the second to, to Mr Mackay on the buffer zones. But um, certainly as regards uh, the, the role of SEPA, uh, clearly I have to be careful why I say there's a, a, a determination in re relation to a specific site which is um, being made by inquiry. So uh, I'll not go into the details of what evidence is given to that inquiry. But suffice to say that um, in, in Scotland we do see ourselves as having a, a, a distinctive uh, approach to uh, unconventional gas as opposed to the UK position. Obviously, the UK is entitled to take the position it has, but in Scotland we have taken the view that we need to ensure that there are appropriate safeguards in place should any opportunity arise uh, in terms of uh, unconventional gas, that it is properly, robustly regulated and that we can give confidence to communities and the wider public in Scotland that. Uh, these opportunities only happen where it's, um, where it's you know, consistent with those, those, those regulatory uh, constraints. And so uh, I haven't had representations directly from SEPA yet as to the resource issues that the member refers to in terms of the, uh, the, the concerns they have raised in that way, but certainly would be happy to, to engage with SEPA if there are indeed any resource implications for them that they, they haven't yet communicated to me. So I can give an undertaking. I will, I will take that, uh, that one forward with 
Mr Sigsworth and, and indeed uh, with um, James Curran at, at SEPA to see if there are any issues there. But uh, just to reassure the member that you know, we uh, appreciate in Falkirk East, as other parts of the country, there is a concern about unconventional gas. There are currently no uh, permits in Scotland for hydraulic fracturing. Uh, we've um, worked with Dar Energy to remove the only uh, consent there was in the case of Cannon Bay, so that has now been uh, removed. Uh, but clearly there are a number of sites which are, are testing for coal bed methane and looking to, to extract it. So, uh, but uh, you know, much of the public discourse has failed to make a distinction between coal bed methane and, and hydraulic fracturing, so lumping them all together as fracking. There are two different technologies, just to put that on the record, and at the moment the only uh, ones with live opportunities at the moment or live um, uh, projects are uh, in relation to coal bed methane rather than um, hydraulic fracturing of shale gas. So uh, we don't presently have any, any concerns in that, uh, in that regard. But there currently is a split between UK functions and, and, and Scottish Government in terms of the, uh, the licensing process. That's something that doesn't sit necessarily that comfortably with us and that you know, we have to um, uh, try and uh, deal with our concerns through the planning system and through the regulatory system rather than having a control of the licensing itself. Um, well, I, I could, uh, could ask um, Mr Mackay if, if he could confirm uh, that the local, plan, local planning authorities will have uh, the power to set the distance of each buffer zone. Uh, well, yes, they would, because each planning authority would be able to use and interpret the uh, current guidance as they see fit uh, to make that local determination. I mean, I won't beat about the bush. Uh, I won't be too delicate. It would be better if the unionist parties of the committee would forgive me just for a moment, if we had independence and all the powers in the one place to make robust and consistent uh, decisions around all matters of policy, not least in, the, in this area, because, of course, there's a number of, a number of agencies involved in, for example, fracking. We would have a uh, DEC uh, in terms of their role, potentially the Coal Authority, uh, SEPA, uh, uh, and, of course, uh, the Planning uh, Authority. So a range of agencies would be involved, but the guiding uh, principle uh, from government is certainly promoting responsible extraction of resources and to assist with this. That's why we've established an expert panel to inform both our policy proposition and local individual planning uh, authorities. And, and again, looking at your individual questions, yes, a planning authority would determine in light of local circumstances uh, what's that appropriate buffer zone and that appropriate separation distance because that would be very much a local factor. And we haven't set a national separation distance. That would be a matter for, for, for local authorities. And uh, Mr Wheelhouse is right. As we understand it, at this point in time, we have no applications in Scotland for fracking. But if one was to appear, then we'd want to ensure that the guidance uh, and, the, and the notification uh, and the, uh, all the best expertise uh, uh, we have available is presented to support any uh, local authority making a determination um, at, at this point in time. But we look forward to the work of the expert, uh, expert scientific uh, panel. Um, but we have been, I think, pretty clear on a government and a direction of travel on this that uh, we expect um, environmental impact to be uh, robustly understood before any consent was given. And then Claudia Bumish. Uh, thank you. Uh, like the Minister, I look forward to Scotland being independent and enjoying all the powers that would go with that. But in the meantime, as I understand it, the Petroleum Act 1998 is the act under which onshore licences are issued, and it contains no requirement to restore the site nor any provision for aftercare. There's nothing in the act at all. Uh, uh, for the licences to explicitly require operators to prove they've got the resources to carry out re restoration work. And the question I want to pose is, does the Scottish Government have the power through SPP or MP3 to take a robust approach to restoration bonds? As I understand it, we require restoration bonds to be lodged for onshore wind turbines. Is there any scope for ensuring we have similar uh, financial uh, insurance, if you like, uh, for what is much more environmentally risky work. Well, there's, there's certainly scope to do that, uh, which was uh, Mr Day's question. There is scope to do it, because of course, any planning authority right now can set conditions and give it, not as part of a licence, but as part of a planning condition uh, for restoration to, to, to restore um, uh, land. 
Uh, of course, the planning system is only about land use. If you even take the issue of fracking, it's only looking at the structures on the ground and above the ground, not necessarily that which lies underneath in that detail. That, that's where other agencies uh, come in. But again, this will also be assisted by the ongoing work and consultation around mineral and coal extraction and, and the uh, issues we've experienced in parts of the country around a failure to, uh, an apparent failure to, to monitor and then remediate land that has been affected from, from mineral extraction. So I think that work will also help us in these terms as well, and it's quite timely for conclusion of revised SPP for the summer of this year. Claudia Beamish. Uh, in fact, I was going to ask about restoration, so I won't ask that question now. I think there's been some clarity around that, and I have had approaches about, about that concern in relation, obviously, as a South Scotland, um, to be parochial again, <laughs> um, uh, MSP in relation to Canonby, but much broader in view of what's happened with open cast um, and, and the lack of restoration bonds. But could I ask you more broadly um, about why in MP... F3, there doesn't appear, as far as I can see, to be anything about um, air pollution in relation to uh, specifically the, the hot spots in cities and whether that would be affected um, in the planning system in terms of what sort of developments could go ahead. I'm happy to take, take that one, uh, convener. Uh, in relation to the NPF3? Well, certainly, yes. I mean, in, in relation to... Yeah. MPA3, I mean, clearly there are a number of um, issues in relation to it. And give, um, the MPA3 facilitates uh, continued movement towards active travel, so that is one driver which will help address uh, air quality issues, particularly in urban areas, but also potentially some of the rural hotspots. Um, it does support the improvement of rail connections in Scotland, so again, that's reducing uh, more damaging forms of commuting, uh, and this could assist in the need for a reduction in car and indeed lorry journeys if we get rail freight uh, addressed. Uh, MPF3 does support the rollout of digital infrastructure, which for the reason I gave earlier on, avoids the need for people to travel in the first place, so you get more use of video conferencing, more use of people working from home, or indeed uh, small businesses uh, locating in rural settings where they can maybe get a competitive broadband connection, whereas at the moment they might have to go to a larger a larger centre, urban centre or a business park to, to achieve the same result. Um, the draft SPP, as opposed to MPF3, supports the planning system and reporting patterns of development which, which reduce the need to travel. Uh, we talked about design earlier in terms of housing and how that can impact uh, and settlements. And uh, also, uh, SPP can direct significant travel generating uses to locations that are better served by transport to avoid uh, creating unsustainable forms of uh, commuting to locations. So there are some specific projects that are being uh, promoted through NPF3 uh, in terms of the M8 Baileyston uh, link, which is a sort of missing link, if you like, in the M8 corridor, uh, which will be opposed by some environmentalists for understandable reasons. I can, I can uh, I respect their position of not necessarily agreeing with it. Um, but it will help address uh, a well-known trouble spot in terms of air quality uh, issues in the city of Glasgow or on the edge of the city of Glasgow. So there will be positive environmental benefits from the point of view of dealing with air quality uh, challenge that we're aware of. And that's the last uh, significant site that will be addressed in the ones that are currently failing to meet the uh, European uh, directive. So uh, while there's an issue about timing there, and we're obviously we'd be keen to get it done quicker than, than we believe it can be done, it will address the uh, long-standing problem in that area. So there are a number of measures in MPA3 which are maybe not badged as air quality measures, but which will have the consequential impact of improving air quality where there are known to be pressures. Uh, I'll just make one further point that uh, whatever is expressed in MPA3 is a spatial, extra, spatial uh, expression and strategy. Um, planning advice notes that will follow from it will reference air quality and how they should be taken into account as a material consideration in any application. It's very helpful, thank you. Can you go on with your yeah. next question? Thank you. Um, I'd like to uh, now ask for your views, ministers, uh, ministers, about the National Ecological Network. And there has been evidence um, from a range of uh, stakeholders, which I won't go into the detail of um, at the moment, uh, but there has been concern expressed that in um, National Planning Framework 2 that there was perhaps more um, emphasis on the possibility of, of the um, National Ecological, Ecological Network, and there is the very strong model of the Central Scotland Network already. Um, and there's a range of evidence that also suggests that there are multiple benefits, which, again, 
really in terms of time I won't go into, but the whole range um, of, of benefits that might, might accrue because of, of a national ecological network. So um, there is disappointment in some quarters, and, and I identify with that uh, as well, that it's not one of the uh, 14 national developments. Do, do either of you have any comment on that, please? Martin and maybe uh, Mr Mackay can come in on the, 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 the sort of drafting reasons. First thing to say is, obviously, we have the 2020 uh, Bio Scotland's Biodiversity Challenge, which is a revised and updated biodiversity um, uh, strategy. That um, will obviously be implemented at a local level by networks of local biodiversity action uh, plan officers within local authorities. I, I have met with a number of them uh, who have been brought to me by, by Dennis Dick in the context of the Biodiversity Committee. And uh, we have discussed a number of things they are doing, one of which, just to flag up, is that uh, I know Biodiversity Action Plan uh, officers in Tayside and Grampian are, are looking themselves, not government directing them to, but are looking themselves to replicate a similar approach to the Central Scotland Green Network. Very early stage, but they're looking at how they can collaborate together on a larger scale to achieve a similar kind of outcome to what has been achieved uh, or is being achieved in the Central Scotland Green Network. Now, as a priority, I mean, certainly from the Environment Portfolio point of view, we are uh, very committed to supporting Central Scotland Green Network and making sure that succeeds. Uh, there have obviously been some changes in terms of the organisation uh, of, of, of uh, CSGN and sort of merger uh, with the Trust to, to create a, a single body which can hopefully provide more uh, resource to, to actual delivery rather than administration um, and have sort of clear lines of communication. That remains a very high priority for us as a government, as a, uh, an exemplar project. It's one that I think is very well respected internationally and indeed uh, we flagged it up to uh, Owen Patterson as a good example of green infrastructure as well that he can use in his um, discussions at European level. So uh, to, to reassure stakeholders and, and, uh, and Ms Beamish that we do place a high value in terms of our achieving our biodiversity strategy and indeed wider impacts on climate change and other areas uh, and getting um, national performance indicators in terms of getting people to get out and enjoy the countryside. We have some great examples of green infrastructure in Scotland which we want to take forward. Just that the, the concept as put to us was a concept rather than a specific project and it is difficult to, to reflect it as such in MPA3 where CSGN is a more defined uh, initiative and strategy. Uh, but I don't know whether Mr Mackay wants to comment on on that. I, I know that Mr Wheelhouse has made a valiant effort to try and reassure uh, Claudia Beamish and in, in not to be disappointed why it's not included. I'll maybe try and reinforce that because it's quite important to see that we value it and we value the, 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 the National Ecological Network. We just weren't sure whether it met the criteria and therefore what national development status adds to it. Now, why do we believe that? Essentially, national development status is about assisting with consenting, giving some certainty within the planning system, sits at, top, sits at the top of the planning a hierarchy, whereas it does feel like more of a, a kind of designation, a status and a concept necessarily than something that would benefit from, from this status. And when we embarked upon a national planning framework three, we set out what the criteria would be for inclusion, we had a participation statement, and there's broad agreement around the uh, the criteria that, that would be used, and certainly the, uh, the ecological network meets uh, some of it. Uh, for example, improving the quality of the built or natural environment, but it didn't meet all the criteria, and like the many hundreds of, of bids that we received didn't quite meet that, that final status. So that's not to say it's not important. It is. It's, it's absolutely important, and it will be referenced in the final document as valuable to Scotland. We just didn't see what added value we get from giving it that status, <clears throat> and therefore it wasn't included as one of the 14. Not all of the 14, of course, are, are site-specific projects. Some of them will stretch the length and breadth of the country, such as the, the National Walking and Cycling Network or the, uh, the Transmission Network for, for, for um, energy supply um, as well. So we do value it. It is important, but it just didn't meet the criteria in the way that we set out to become a national uh, development as such, but still valued by the Scottish Government and certainly um, it is supported by ministers. So would it be possible for um, the committee to have sight of how, how that criteria were developed? Because I think it would, would be reassuring. Yes, um, I'm, I'm happy to share that with the committee. And I tell you, if you suffer from insomnia, it will help you out. <laughs> the, the level of detail that it goes, goes into... I regret asking um, that question. But, 
there, there are no, is the rapporteur. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. <laughs> there's, there's, there's no great secrets in it, and this is uh, Dr. Simpson has some of the paperwork as a wee snapshot. But if you want to feast your eyes on that, then on your cell, as we say in the West. Thank you very much. Right. Talking about which climate adaptation and resilience, um, Jim Hume. Yes, uh, thank you, and I'll, I'll try and merge two questions into one just to speed things along. Um, if, that, if, if that's possible. Yes, re regarding climate adaptation and uh, resilience, SEPA thought regarding flooding that um, perhaps the document could go a bit further um, and even, even suggest in the document that housing and some developments should actually avoid flood, flood risk areas. Uh, SEPA were also concerned, as was Glasgow City Council, regarding resilience. Um, there's quite a bit in about resilience in sort of what you might call green environmental issues, but resilience, of course, will uh, in the future uh, need a um, joint up approach regarding transport um, buildings and, of course, communication systems. So just wondered to ask you two questions in one, how the NPF3 uh, actually does support delivery of a sustainable flood risk management, can it go a bit further? And also regarding uh, resilience, can uh, do you think there's room that it should be spread out to uh, in include other areas like transport, communications, etc.? Um, if I firstly address the issue in terms of uh, flood risk and flood risk management, I certainly think in Scotland we are uh, in a position where we have um, you know, the necessary tools to do the job in terms of the Flood Risk Management Scotland Act is an excellent piece of legislation and is it's obviously helping to inform our strategy and, and rollout of investment across Scotland in partnership with COSLA. Uh, we have um, a, very recently, in January, in fact, published flood risk and hazard maps, which are a very good, important tool for local authorities, uh, local responders and indeed communities to help make themselves more resilient and to, to inform the planning process in terms of where it would be appropriate or inappropriate to, uh, to develop residential property, but also other, uh, other business classes and, and so forth. So that's a very important tool as well. Um, we are just embarking on our next phase of river basin management planning um, through SEPA. So that's the uh, next exercise that they are doing, 30, 30 catchments. Uh, uh, so but there, there's a lot of work to be done in terms of priority catchments. Um, uh, our draft Scottish planning policy has been revised to reflect uh, flood risk. Um, uh, and it is noted as a, a national issue in NPF3 as well. So it's, it's certainly something that's flagged up and recognised. Um, I'll leave Mr Mackay to deal with the spatial aspects of it. But the, the consultation identified climate change as our principal overarching policy as well, and therefore, obviously, adaptation to climate change as well is a, a key aspect of that, and to be factored into all planning decisions. Um, and the policy included uh, adaptation, as I say. So I think we are in a position where it's a bit of an, it's an example, I suppose, of the point that was made very early on in this session, that um, we, we can expect NPF3 to be a compendium of absolutely every policy that the government has. It does signpost readers and, and planners uh, and developers to the fact that we have overarching climate change policy, uh, that we have an adaptation uh, uh, programme being developed, and that flood risk is flagged up as an uh, issue of national importance. Uh, and then we've got all the underpinning pieces of work that I've discussed in terms of the flood risk hazard uh, maps and, and also the uh, uh, fl uh, Flood Risk uh, Management Scotland Act underpinning all. So we have, there's another example, I guess, of of signposting and making sure people are, t are cognizant of the, of the challenges and the issues they need to take into account in terms of uh, planning process, but that the detail and, the, and the, the overarching strategy in terms of flood risk management is presented elsewhere in associated documents. And uh, I think we, we can feel confident as a parliament that we have got very comprehensive uh, uh, provision in terms of policy on flood risk. And we are obviously developing a local response, working with partners like uh, councils such as Dumfries and Galloway and indeed Angus and other councils to, to work on uh, specific projects uh, that we can take forward. Mr Hume would be, would expect and would be right to expect us to be watching what's happening elsewhere to make sure that if there are any lessons to be learnt, we will learn them in terms of uh, response resilience and indeed proactive planning as well. I think we're in a strong place in terms of the planning process. It might not feature an MPF3, but again, in planning advice notes, that which lies behind this work, it might not set out 
uh, where are the flood risk in terms of that? And I mean, that you know, MPF3 is almost for some an investment uh, document, but certainly uh, flood risk uh, and water attenuation and so on would be, and waste would be something that would be considered in any planning decision, such as uh, drainage and, and infrastructure and so on. So I hope that reassures uh, the member. Then connecting to the question around resilience, and that, that's on your, on your reference, Glasgow, and that will be partly about regeneration uh, as well as resilience, and, and that's why we're adopting, for example, the uh, town centre first approach uh, about uh, regenerating sites rather than necessarily building uh, on, on the green belt first and, and how we uh, deploy our, our planning decisions and, and weigh up some of the challenges. So there's a lot, a lot around sustainability, regeneration uh, and resilience. And in terms of Glasgow, I suppose the yeah. examples we would pick on, on, on what does Glasgow stand to benefit, of course, the the Commonwealth Games won't be an MPF3, they were an MPF2. You might ask why. Well, they'll be done by the time we've concluded MPF3, therefore it doesn't add value. But I think it has assisted in that overall package of regeneration in Glasgow around the Commonwealth Games and legacy and how it's interconnected to policies. But ongoing work for Glasgow would include, for example, the Strategic Drainage Partnership, other developments at Clyde um, uh, Gateway and the Central Scotland Green Network, just as a few that I think will add to the resilience and the regeneration of, of that part of the country, and that's the same right over the country as well. Uh, another example of where regeneration and resilience comes into play in terms of local economy would be the Ravenscraig site as well, which we're proposing to give a national development status for the first time as well, because we believe that that will assist in some of the planning status that would be afforded to the area. Can I just add one point, if I may, uh, convener, uh, briefly, I'm conscious of time, just to say that the, the maps I described um, also, for the first time, map uh, the surface water uh, co flooding at risk as well as coastal and, and fluvial or river flooding risks. So we've got um, the ability now to map all the, all the potential uh, risks from flooding uh, from that aspect of resilience. Uh, and uh, clearly we're now working with like, the Scottish Water in terms of their investment plans as well. That's, they will take account of these factors and this mapping in, in terms of prioritising what they have to do on drainage. So, so we're, you know, we are um, getting a more coordinated and cohesive uh, approach to, to, to specific issues like flood risk. And obviously the point you made about uh, critical infrastructure like energy uh, infrastructure is, is absolutely, uh, absolutely right. Um, we need to have an overview of, of resilience of those kind of uh, infrastructure investments as well. Oh, thanks. That's fine. Thanks. John? Thank you, Kavina, and uh, good morning, gentlemen. I'm wondering if I could just pursue um, Paul Wheelhouse's his comments about all these maps because they provide very useful information. But they do, of course, also the other side of the coin is that they make it extremely difficult for some people to get insurance for flooding. Um, the more obvious it is that there's a risk, the less likely it is that somebody wants to cover it. I appreciate it's tangential to this morning's discussion, uh, and it won't be in MPF3, but... but what can the government do to ensure that all this good information doesn't backfire and so that our constituents, in fact, we will all have them in the right places, uh, simply find that it's actually a disadvantage and they can't get insured against this hazard? Um, Nigel Don raises a very fair point, if I may say so. I mean, I think we, we need to um, ensure that the maps are as accurate as possible so that we're not um, unfairly uh, burdening someone with perhaps a perceived flood risk when there isn't a, a flood risk. So the, the accuracy of the maps is, uh, is improving all the time. What the maps are now showing is not only the um, extent of flooding, which was the old uh, approach that you showed in certain uh, risk scenarios, the extent of flooding in an area, but not necessarily its depth, velocity or impact. So, so the maps are now becoming much more sophisticated. They will show the extent to which a flood will happen, which is the same as previously. It will show it in three different scenarios, a low, uh, low medium and, and high frequency uh, events, and it will show it in terms of the depth and velocity of the water uh, that's flooding, and also the source, whether it's surface water, fluvial or coastal, so that there's much more sophisticated information. We are in parallel working with the insurance industry and with stakeholders to make sure that we have as accurate po possible information from all 32 local authorities to demonstrate where uh, flood protection has been uh, put in place to help reduce the risk of that flooding uh, to the community and therefore that should be taken into account and I've had by insurances, uh, assurances from the insurance industry that they would take that into account in determining uh, uh, premiums at a local level and the size of excess. So we can give communities insurance, uh, you know, an assurance that if investment is made that should have a knock-on impact in terms of reducing their perceived flood risk and the premiums and, and excesses that they are likely to be charged. So getting a, a more sophisticated approach uh, throughout from start to finish, if you like. 
But if I might just continue that, convener, I mean, would, would, would the minister accept that the problem is those who do have a perceived risk and are now in a, an evaluated, enumerated risk, but who also are not going to find any mitigation turning up from any scheme because it simply isn't sensible to do so? Uh, I guess what's concerning me is the ability of us as a nation to protect ourselves and to ensure that, that the hazards which we can't mitigate, because that really should be a collective thing. I, I, I would address that as well, sorry if I didn't address it properly in my, my answer. The, uh, the other aspects of the, 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 the process, if you like, are obviously the UK government has lodged through its uh, water bill, it's, it's lodging a proposal for flood re, which is a, uh, an insurance um, uh, initiative to ensure that uh, there is effectively cross-subsidy from all policyholders across, across the UK uh, to those properties that are at perceived higher risk of flood risk. So um, they will be, their premiums will be brought down to a level that is more sustainable for those individuals. Uh, and it only affects residential properties at the moment, but uh, which I appreciate is an issue for communities that have businesses that have been affected by flooding. But it will help uh, to ensure that uh, well, we're not being, we weren't consulting its development. We are supporting the general approach and uh, as, as the, the best offer on the table, and, and that will hopefully bring down the risk of high premiums. The other thing we can do, which is not related to NPF3 or SPP, obviously, is look at um, uh, property level protection. And we're doing an evaluation through a consultancy uh, to, uh, to understand the effectiveness of property level protection so that we can advise uh, communities and individuals where there perhaps isn't a possibility of a mitigation project or large scale uh, flood protection project of what best products would be and what the best approach would be to protect their property and look at other ways in which we can support them. But, on insurance, I re recognise it's an issue, um, uh, and it's one I'm, I'm, I'm due to speak to Aidan Carr of ABI in the next couple of days uh, to catch up with him about um, the impact of the events in England on the insurance uh, proposal that's been brought forward by the UK government. Okay. Thank you, Vina. Uh, I'm grateful for the diversion. Okay. Uh, on NPF3, uh, Alec Ferguson, a comment, did you? On this, on flooding? No. Okay, good. Can we move on to rural development issues? Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Convener. Um, in terms of uh, uh, the ownership of um, assets by communities, which has been raised in evidence um, to the committee, uh, we, uh, as a committee, we've been to Gia and seen the vibrant community there. There's obviously the um, Land Reform uh, Review Group, which won't be reporting particularly timelessly in terms of, of MPF3, but um, in terms of also of uh, community ownership of energy, there's an issue in relation to planning. And I'm wondering, do both the ministers consider that community ownership of assets is an important driver for rural development? And if so, um, how should this be if it can be reflected in MPF3? First thing to say uh, is that in terms of the timing of the Land Reform Review Group, uh, the report itself will be hopefully available uh, within April, but may you know, at, at worst into the beginning of May. Um, and uh, you know we, we would expect to have, at least from the point of view of parliamentary stakeholders and, and members, uh, to, to have access to that report on that timescale. Uh, clearly, community ownership um, is something that is seen to be very important from the government's perspective. We have uh, announced a target through the First Minister of doubling the amount of land in community ownership by 2020, which will be a difficult but, I believe, achievable um, objective. It is primarily because we, we want to see uh, you know, communities empowered to take control of their future along the lines of examples such as GIA uh, and others, which uh, from, from small-scale projects for people just extending a village hall through to larger-scale projects, people taking on a large uh, land holdings in estates, crofting estates, um, that this is an opportunity for them to be empowered and to take control of their future and to, to determine their own economic path. So it's a very important part of it. Um, it links into land use. There's obviously, um, in some respects, land reform um, is seen in isolation. I do recognise that the point that's been made by many stakeholders that it sits uh, you know, neatly with discussion about land use. So it's not just changing ownership. That's not the objective in itself. It's about what you use the land for and how do you deliver um, uh, economic benefit for for the community uh, in question. So um, we are aware of the need to, to make sure that these two strands uh, work together, so land use and land and land reform, uh, but primarily, the, obviously, the land reform review group is looking at the land reform aspects, but they will touch, I'm sure, on land use issues as well. 
Yes, I, I absolutely agree, but have to be just ever so slightly careful just in terms of the planning system, because the purists in the planning system would say it, it takes no account of ownership in determining land use purely, and that's true, uh, but the planning system can take into account economic impact and certainly community benefit of, of certain um, decisions. So we are supportive of, uh, you touched upon energy, of course, it would connect to broadband and mobile coverage as well, so that, you know, every part of the country enjoys a, a digital uh, revolution, and, and certainly the, the targets that Mr Wheelhouse uh, mentioned uh, are supportive. And we, we do mention within planning policy community benefit, uh, in addition to where we're going on specifically community ownership, which community ownership wouldn't be addressed through planning policy, but certainly through legislation such as the Community Empowerment Scotland Bill um, is certainly would be, and you know, in essence, to your question, do we support community ownership as a way to drive local regeneration? Yes, we do. Um, Jim Hume. Yes, yes. Moving on, on to rural housing, we've had various uh, uh, comments from uh, outside organisations, some thinking that we should just concentrate housing on well, basically towns and others like uh, Scottish R rural colleges who uh, need uh, request that we should have uh, more housing in the countryside and as I'm sure Paul Wheelhouse at least will know uh, in our, our rural region it's very difficult for youth to get access to homes and it's very difficult for uh, retired rural business people I suppose to, to uh, retire into their own, their own communities therefore I was just wondering if the Minister or Ministers uh, thought that we have the right balance at the moment with the NPF3 and the planning policy, Scottish planning policy, between protecting landscape and actually, actually realising the, the economic activity that haps, happens in our rural landscape that, that, that needs housing, of course. Certainly, um, I would, I would uh, echo many of the points that um, Mr Hume has just made. I mean, certainly, the provision of housing is a key component of making sure that, as I described in my opening remarks, that we have you know, vibrant uh, rural communities that people can, can enjoy living and working in and, and that they are sustainable locations, obviously, but that they provide the kind of facilities and access to affordable housing uh, that, uh, that rural communities need just every bit as much as, as uh, urban communities. Uh, and so it's a very important aspect of, 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 of policy. I think it goes back to the point that we were making earlier on in relation to um, landscape impact and wild land, that um, we're not saying that, either, as, as, as Mr Mackay put it, there anywhere that's a no-go area, um, that we, um, we have to work, yes, in, in sensitivity to whatever uh, protected features or indeed um, uh, uh, other, other environmental considerations are in place in, in areas, and obviously that becomes a particular... Uh, challenge in locations like uh, the Cairngorm National Park, where you have um, the, uh, the, 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 the sheer breadth of protected features and sites within that area makes it a challenge to find locations which are, are meeting the community's aspiration, but at the same time um, living within the uh, sustainable development principles that we all, we all support. So I think there's, there's definitely uh, support from the point of view that you're, you're making that we need to look at opportunities for rural housing, and I know that Struck and, and others have been very active on this issue, uh, but I think the, the NPF3 does support that development. It's, it is about very much about looking at uh, rural Scotland as a sustainable and, and vibrant place to live and work, and uh, I believe that's the overarching strategy. The detail obviously comes in, and as I understand it, in Scottish planning policy, but Mr Mackay will be better placed to, to, to deal with that. There's an expectation on planning authorities to ensure that there's enough, there's a generous supply of land to deliver local housing need, and that those figures are, are driven by a local housing need and demand a assessment. And that can sometimes be at scale, and that's fine. I mean, you could read the document and say, well, you're proposing development uh, largely in you know, the conurbations or uh, Perth, Aberdeen, Edinburgh. Well, that's where demand is oh, at scale. I mean, there's obviously demand at Inverness as well. But for rural areas, there's two points. First of all, that we are uh, supportive for um, developments to be flexible about that. But what I'm very aware of from my involvement as planning minister is individual applications as well are important. So they might not meet um, scale in terms of housing development, but are absolutely vital for rural areas, uh, not least not least in the Highlands. And so I think we have to be flexible and supportive of individual developments too. And, and you know, sometimes it might depart from the plan-led system, and that's okay as long as there's material 
considerations that justify that and a sense of place, because we haven't discussed really placemaking today, but it's at the heart of planning policy. So as long as a development, even an individual site, is in keeping with the local environment, then that's a good thing. But to maintain, to sustain the population of some parts of rural Scotland, indeed it's in Greece, uh, some parts of uh, rural Scotland, then I think the planning system and its policy, and even more importantly in its implementation, has to be quite liberal, should I say, and sometimes uh, permissive, because from time to time, convener, I hate to tell you, but there are sometimes overzealous planners out there. There are not many, not numerous, but they can exist, and I think you know, sometimes we have to be a bit more supportive, ensuring that we do create the infrastructure and the housing that allows uh, um, a sustainable future for rural areas, and for that reason, the policies are supportive, but even more important on this occasion, it's implementation on the ground that matters. And that kind of culture where if you design the right kind of property, yes, it could be in keeping with the local environment, as opposed to, well, it's not in a plan, therefore computer says no. No, that's not the kind of approach that the, the government would support. And that includes the 32 planning authorities led by local authorities and the, the two national parts as well, I hasten to add. And so sometimes inadverted uh, additions to the planning process, such as occupancy conditions, are irrelevant to a planning um, uh, decision and determination, I think, have been ill-advised and how they've been used sometimes in the past. There's a lot we could say in this, I guess. Uh, just, but Jim, yeah, but you just, to finish off this just point? To follow, just to uh, fin finish off that, that, that question, and I'm glad to hear that Derek Mackay uh, agrees it's a good thing to be a liberal. Uh, that's a capital L for the, the official report. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Words to that effect. Pickle was uh, <laughs> anyway, not funded by either. No, no matter. Just the, the last part to the, the question. S SR, uh, Scottish Rural Colleges, said there was actually a need for uh, additional government support to help rural uh, communities regarding house. And is that something that's in the pipeline? I would have to direct that to, to, to colleagues in, in, in housing, but, uh, but certainly you know, we do have a number of initiatives which I know have, occasionally have their critics, but you know, to, to help with um, uh, crofting, housing for crofters, for example, through uh, grants that are specifically designed for that purpose. And uh, clearly I think um, you know, rural, rural housing, uh, in terms of the quality of the housing, is a big issue as well. So it's not just the number of, but the quality of housing, because we do have a disproportionate number of older solid wall poorly heated or poorly uh, energy e efficiency rated properties uh, so that's a big challenge as well i know uh, margaret burgess is is taking forward um but there are uh, you know i, I certainly know uh, anecdotally of, of many rural housing associations that do uh, obviously receive grant funding from scottish government to provide housing at a local level including in the borders uh, and, and other regions of the south of scotland so we can come back with a uh, response from our housing colleagues if that would be helpful to the committee on that point. Okay. Yeah, this, the issue of the balance of new housing provision, particularly in the national parks, the uh, Badenoch Strasbourg Conservation Group uh, calling for NPF3 to focus new housing in the national parks, particularly the Cairngorms National Park, obviously, on meeting genuine local need. They argue that too many large open market houses, only a small number of affordable houses, and too many second homes are coming forward. They've actually suggested in particular the introduction of a residency criteria for the Cairngorms National Park, for example, where excessive new build housing would be um, you know, obviously restricted to people who had a, a long-standing relationship with the area. Uh, potentially, that would offer, I would suspect, a better chance for young people to remain in the areas where they've been born and raised, and Jim Hume touched upon retiring people as well, um, because losing young people from rural communities has considerable consequences for those areas. And as Jim Hume touched upon as well, I mean, the, the SRUC in evidence particularly highlighted the issue of uh, access and housing for young people in rural areas. I just wonder if, if the proposal that's been mentioned there is something that could be considered as worthy of consider, can consideration. I have to say, from a planning point of view, I'm not immediately attracted to it because the more complications, criteria, and formula you put into someone getting a plan application, I think the more difficult it becomes. Surely the way will create sustainable, vibrant, dynamic um, local environments uh, and economies is, is creating more opportunities um, by ensuring that there are jobs prospects and there's, there's that economic growth and size and composition of a household's uh, 
uh, important as well. Now, my experience is that occupancy conditions have made it harder to get the right kind of developments as opposed to easier. So I'm not immediately attracted to that in terms of the planning system. Now, in terms of grants and other things, you know, that may be a consideration. But no, I, I, I think a more can do enabling culture within planning is the kind of one that will generate economic growth and retention of a population rather than a more uh, uh, restricted one. I think I would, uh, uh, certainly echo what Mr Mackay has said. I would have a slight um, concern. I mean, I will, I will certainly listen to, um, to, to any evidence that's brought forward to me as a minister responsible for the national parks. Uh, but uh, I, I would have a concern about you know, having a... Uh, you know, approach which was focused on on residency in terms of getting houses uh, at this stage. Notwithstanding, I would listen to the arguments made, but in the sense that the, I know there are many issues in terms of attracting skills into into national park that that could then be a barrier. Um, you know, potentially for someone who's needed to be a key worker in the national park, wouldn't be able to get access to a house. Um, uh, you know, so I know there. Are there, there could be potentially challenges there that would be, would be difficult. The other thing is to say that, you know, obviously, as, as Mr Mackay is saying, it's about trying to make sure that there are the range of employment opportunities and other uh, education and learning opportunities uh, locally for people to, to be able to remain in the area rather than have to leave. But it also should be said that it can be a good thing for people to leave an area, gain experience and come back. And uh, what we have to do is provide the opportunity for them to come back when they've had that experience. Uh, and, uh, I suppose the challenge for somewhere like the National Parks, and more generally the Highlands Islands in the past, has been that there's a huge demographic dip where th so many people leaving in that age group that there's, um, there's not a consequent flow back in from outside the area to, to balance things up. And so you get a, a, a kind of mismatch in terms of supply and demand uh, for people, uh, young people going into employment, that there's not enough young folk available to perhaps uh, provide the skills that are needed. Um, but yes, uh, I would be slightly concerned about a residency test for building, uh, building houses, uh, but I certainly haven't heard any evidence on that so far from, from either uh, Badnock and Strass Bay Group or indeed from the National Park themselves as to what their view would be. Um, but uh, happy to listen to it, but I would be concerned for the reasons I gave that there might be a barrier to attracting people who are skilled workers into the area to fulfil a, a defined economic need. Yeah, thank you for that answer. That, that's quite informative. But can I just develop it slightly convenient for me? Because SRUC actually suggested that, in their view, um, there's nothing specific in MPF3 that, that mentions the issue, that uh, attempts to check the outward migration. In fact, they said, um, i find the exact quote, uh, young people are not mentioned at all. Is that a valid criticism? Or what, what could you point to as an MPF3 yeah. to tackle that issue? You know, we, 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 might, we might not talk about older people, younger people, uh, the disabled, uh, specific uh, you know, ethnic groups as well in the document, but you cannot read through this and not conclude it's for all the people of Scotland to, clay, to create a kind of successful, sustainable place which has a future. Uh, so you know, I, I'm quite passionate that this will make a, a difference and will contribute to a whole host of other strategies, and it's for all the people of Scotland. But do you know what we've not done? We've not gone through a tick-box mentality in making sure that we've hit every category, every piece of jargon, uh, and every group that you would want to say. We've actually got, a, I think, a document here that does a job and does it very effectively. And we've not covered every single part of the country by name either because it's about the policies and the mechanisms that will deliver without having that tick box mentality. So if you're a young person, my message to you would be this is about giving you a future, a sustainable future, jobs, housing, employment, uh, access, digital connectivity. It's got everything for you without having to put it out of some sort of shopping list. So I would, I would reject any claim very strongly that, it, that it's not for every part of the country and every person in the country. I think it's, it's very dynamic indeed. And this isn't even the finished version, of course. <laughs> Af after your engagement, it'll be even better. <laughs> well, Thank we you. Hope that this message gets transferred to every local planning officer uh, because most certainly the individual experience is something that we're very conscious of in terms of uh, making homes available. Uh, Touching one aspect, which is slightly different to, to what has been said. I mean, it's always a tough act to follow Mr. Mackay when he's in full flow. <laughs> um, but if I could just sort of divert one, one aspect of MPF, uh, MPF3, which I think is important for rural areas and being a resident of rural areas, as many members on the, the, the committee are, is that um, it supports the development and the creation of service clusters in, in our towns. 
in a rural town. So at the moment, there tends to be a kind of a two-speed model. Rural, rural economy is a rural economy, and there's not sort of the competitive kind of locations for the kind of business service uh, jobs uh, uh, that could be located um, currently in urban areas. And what we want to see is rural Scotland develop in a way that is vibrant and uh, the exciting places to work as well as to live. And that means creating the kind of opportunity so you've got viable uh, alternatives to working in, in an urban context and making sure, as, as Mr Mackay said, the broadband infrastructure is up to, up to scratch to enable that kind of investment to take mm. place. Alec Ferguson. I just to make Thank you, yeah. Davina, which I made at committee uh, at previous meetings as well, which is certainly in, in my experience, um, too often in, in my part of rural Scotland, social housing development is taking place um, based on where the infrastructure supports that development, which is not necessarily the same place as the need for the housing. And there is a need for, for social housing, bad need for it, in Dumfries and Galloway. Um, and and the, the result of that is that a recent development in the village next to where I live, um, of 34 houses, actually the housing provider is having trouble filling that because people are taking other considerations like cost of getting to travel because the, the, the public transport system is not great um, uh, and other you know people are taking other considerations in and turning down the opportunity of moving into a brand new house which they'd love to do because of these other considerations and I, I just want to make that point because I think it's really important to have that joined up thinking with the provision of, of, of particularly sewerage and Scottish water facilities uh, in, in these developments because too often I think the development is driven by the ability to build there rather than the actual need for it. Mr Mackay. I think, I think that's very helpful for us uh, to hear. There's a subtlety within this as well and something we've consulted upon and I want to ensure we get it right. In terms of private sector development, there's a quota around how much of a site should be affordable housing. And I think it was about 25%. It's applied slightly differently across the country. And sometimes that, um, that quota is unhelpful. Sometimes it will make a development unviable which is maybe not what we want in terms of economic growth, we might accept that the development should go ahead without a certain quota or that the quota is insensitive to local circumstances such as specialist housing. And that's why we've consulted on the quota question as well. And it does relate to getting the right development in the right places, uh, as well as the point that uh, Mr Ferguson made. So that's very helpful for us, and we'll bear that in mind. I think one, one thing I would just say is a point that was made to, to Claudia Beamish earlier on, that um, you know, if we are directing development to where possible to, to make use of uh, you know, existing public transport infrastructure that would make it more attractive for people who are looking for affordable housing and maybe have got greater cost pressures on them in terms of trying to avoid having to use uh, you know, expensive uh, private vehicles. So by, by virtue of the fact we're looking at it from a low carbon perspective and making sure there's active travel routes and other means by which people can get to, to uh, employment centres or indeed for public transport to get to employment, that will make them more vi viable locations for, for people to take that that uh, affordable housing option up rather than leaving it vacant because it's in the wrong place. I'm conscious about having to, to move on, but uh, Angus uh, McDonald next on the, this. Okay, thanks, Convener. Um, heading to the, the islands, um, NPF3 states that uh, Scotland's coasts and islands have an unprecedented opportunity to secure growth from renewable energy uh, generation, which will bring employment and reverse population decline. Uh, which is clearly good news. However, we're aware that uh, Scottish Power has recently shelved its involvement in the Tyree Array, uh, and SSE is currently reviewing its involvement in offshore renewables. So if progress in taking forward offshore renewables is not as fast as the Scottish Government anticipates, what other opportunities are available to support rural development in coastal and island communities, and how does NPF3 reflect this? <laughs> First. Okay. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, development, some of it is uh, uh, mixed use uh, in some of the ports and harbours that we've got. So we've got the uh, NRIP sites uh, in addition uh, included within MPF3. And uh, again, some of the developments, as I mentioned earlier, are wholly dependent on the private sector bringing these proposals uh, forward. So there's some competition at some of that. Uh, harbours uh, and ports, and if one development doesn't take off, then there's um, still potential for, for other developments and other industries. So it will be a combination, it will be a mix. Um, you know, some of our coastal, area, coastal areas may enjoy growth in the tourism market or, or, or marine uh, recreation or fishing and aquaculture, not just uh, renewables. 
So it's about a balanced approach. But what, we've, what I think we've done more effectively this time is connect the national planning framework of land use with the marine strategy as well and marine opportunities. And MPF3 in itself, I think, is looking more to the, the coast and coastal communities than maybe it did in previous uh, iterations because of the potential that um, exists. So individual projects may not have proceeded, not helped by some of the decisions or lack of decisions, I have to say, uh, by uh, UK government. Uh, but it's important that this strategy isn't just a document for one year or two years of the short term, but actually puts in place some of the, the planning certainty for the future for a generation. That's what it's about, generational change. So to answer the question very briefly, it's about balance, about mixed opportunities, but giving greater deal of certainty. And if we do have at some of these sites more commercial progress, then we're well placed in terms of the planning system and the functions to release and realise the opportunities uh, there. But it does connect with the government's emphasis around the National Renewables Infrastructure Project sites that, that, that you mentioned uh, in your question. If I can just, just add to that complimentary um, stuff rather than go over what Mr McKay has already said. Clearly we've also uh, got the opportunities for specific sectors. Uh, many of the island groups, coastal areas are uh, potentially to benefit from cruise traffic and development of marine tourism. Um, that's something that's identified in the, uh, at local level in terms of the list of projects and initiatives uh, each of the island authorities and indeed in the Highland area and Argyll and Butte. Um, so that's, that's an opportunity. Aquaculture, and uh, as you expect me to say as a Minister for Aquaculture, is a huge opportunity for many of our rural uh, island communities. Uh, it's it's the, probably the key sector in terms of employment, other than um, certainly for private sector employment in Shetland, uh, both in terms of uh, finfish and shellfish production. It's a major centre and it's something that um, you know, the, the uh, uh, island authority are keen to further develop. Uh, we do have, uh, through parallel initiatives that we're talking about in terms of uh, land reform process, community empowerment, this will, and, and our focus on creating towns as, as I say, service centres and hubs of economic activity, that will benefit island authority areas and, and coastal communities every bit as much as uh, more mainland authorities. And so uh, the investment in broadband infrastructure is absolutely crucial to make uh, it possible for people to live and work on a competitive basis in somewhere like uh, the Western Isles. Uh, so there's a lot of parallel things going on. Uh, as I say, you wouldn't expect it to, to all be addressed in MPF3, but there are a number of specific initiatives that are mentioned in there relating to tourism developments, uh, particularly marine tourism in the case of the islands and, uh, and, and also uh, broadband infrastructure. Okay, thanks for that. Um, most of these points have been raised in, in a submission by uh, Cameron and Ellen Sia, um, in which they, they make a number of uh, salient points, not least the fact that Scotland's western seaboard is home to one of the richest renewable energy resources in Europe. Um, and as, the, as um, Mr Mackay mentioned, also the NRIP sites highlight that the uh, Arnish, Kishorn and Mahrahanish uh, are key locations for development of, of renewables. Um, it would be churlish not to mention uh, today, convener, the, uh, that Lewis and Harris have been named by TripAdvisor as the, the best islands to visit in the world uh, today, um, which clearly is very welcome, not that I'm biased or anything. Uh, so increasing uh, tourist uh, footfall on the islands is, is clearly uh, paramount. However, in NPF3, uh, there is mention of support for hutting. Um, following the example of our Scandinavian neighbours. Uh, now, the Western Isles Council have uh, raised some concerns with, or they make some reference to this uh, with regard to, um, in their formal response, with regard to a uh, provision of infrastructure, visual cumulative impact in open landscapes and use class definition. Uh, and I was just seeking an assurance from uh, both ministers that uh, the, the concerns that the Council has raised uh, will be taken on board as you uh, progress with NPF3. We'll look at the specific comment. First of all, can I say of the islands that Mr Macdonald mentioned, congratulations. And of course, we'll be helped by the fact that the airports of Scotland will enjoy uh, national designation uh, as well as part of NPF3. So the, the airports within Scotland have been upgraded, um, which is good for connectivity to, to the islands. Um, as well, just a further example of how something quite subtle in the, in the document actually assists in terms of sustainable economic growth. Now, we're concerned or, or we're aware 
of some of the correspondence around Hutting. Actually, probably the biggest single campaign in MPF3 was Hutting, to our surprise. <laughs> um, and we've had a wide uh, consultation process. So we'll take... <laughs> Sorry, convener. It's a, it's a housing problem in another guise. Yes, well... Indeed. Um, we will, so we'll look at some of the concerns, but like with everything else, if there, you know, there's a sense of lack of... There's a principle here that we support um, around a promotion of hutting in Scotland, and then some of the guidance that planning authorities would like around that. You know, what's the definition? What infrastructure requires? So, of course, we'll look at what they want and then try and give them that guidance so there's consistency across the country. Uh, but I dare say it will be slightly less controversial than energy or other policies, so we will commit to giving them as much clarity as, as they like. Because, of course, the planning system is, is it's about individuals making decisions, weighing up, different, weighing up different issues, and they like planners as much guidance as they can get. So um, Dr Simpson will resolve that issue by our next meeting and ensure that the, <laughs> uh, the guidance is, is produced to, to keep within the aspiration that it's something that can be enjoyed in Scotland we should certainly promote. Thank you. Um, Alec Ferguson, have a point in the next... Um, well, I was going to raise a question about national parks until you rather purloined my question earlier on, Convener. <laughs> but um, <laughs> I, I just wanted to make two points, because in response to the Convener's question, um, Mr Wheelhouse made a statement that I would have to question, I think, certainly from my own part of the world's perspective. Um, I've long championed the prospect of a Dumfries and Galloway National Park, if there was to be further development of a national park. And I hasten to add that my, my enthusiasm for that has got nothing to do with the fact that it might um, reduce development of wind farms across the region. Um, it is entirely to do with sustainable economic development, uh, of which my region is in uh, great need. Um, but the one thing I wanted to question was when Mr Wheelhouse suggested that he had not been able to identify any growing enthusiasm for further national parks. And I would question that in Dumfries and Galloway, simply because when I first started to raise this in 2003, I would have agreed with him. I couldn't actually um, find much enthusiasm for it. But recently, within the region, as I'm sure he knows, the count, both the Council and the Dumfries and Galloway Chamber of Commerce and others have come out strongly in favour of the development of that. So I simply want to make the point that while it may, it may be the case on a national basis that uh, there is not growing enthusiasm, I, I don't think he could say that in Dumfries and Galloway. I mean, I think if I check back the record, I, I, I said there had received some individual uh, pieces of correspondence, but there's not been a groundswell, it was the point I made. We've not had a large uh, number, or indeed the, the organisations that, that uh, Mr Ferguson mentioned, I'm not aware of them actually having directly written to me uh, in terms of Chamber of Commerce, other, other bodies. Uh, I'll stand, stand to be corrected, I'll come back to committee if that's not true, but yeah, certainly, sure. certainly yeah, I've, I've not, yeah, I've not sure. had uh, anything directly so far. So, I mean, the, the government has taken the view that um, we haven't had any uh, if you like, well-defined firm proposals. There was, obviously, in historic terms, uh, in relation to Harris, um, a, a proposal for a national park, which went to a local vote. Uh, it was in the local people voted in favour of it, but the council decided uh, not to take that forward. So that wasn't the government, um, you know, ignoring the views of the public. It was, it was, uh, if you like, the local authority to, decided not to take forward a proposal for a national park in that case, uh, as my, I understand it, before my time, uh, obviously. Uh, so, you know, we, but we don't... Uh, other than the, uh, the representation that we made by stakeholders who uh, are campaigning specifically for a uh, programme of new national parks or indeed to protect rural Scotland for perhaps the reason that Mr Ferguson is not supporting um, uh, a, a park in Dumfries and Galloway, but maybe because of the wind farm issue, if I put it in those very simplistic terms, uh, that have contacted me in that, in that regard. So um, uh, I have met with them. Uh, we have made clear our position and... Uh, we would need to have uh, some support in terms of uh, more de clearly defined proposals for national parks than we have been given hitherto. Uh, but I happily receive any uh, correspondence from Mr Ferguson's constituents and, and my own, dare I say it, um, regarding uh, proposals in Dumfries and Galloway. Thank you. And uh, finally, Nigel Don. Thank you very much, Convener. I wonder whether I can go briefly back to the discussion we had about affordable housing and rural towns being vibrant centres of business, which I, which I don't wish to repeat. I'm just wondering whether there's anything which the planning framework should do uh, to talk about affordability. In other words, whether the economics of living and doing work in the, in, in the rural uh, areas is something which it can address. Plainly, very obviously, transport costs are always higher. There are many others. 
Uh, General Principal, I, I, I certainly accept that um, the cost of living is high. I know there has been work done um, uh, for, uh, through the Joseph Rowntree Foundation for uh, Highlands and Islands Enterprise area. It looked at the cost of living. I believe the figures were suggesting up to 20 per cent additional cost uh, of living in, in rural uh, Highlands and Islands compared with urban Scotland. So that clearly defines that there is an issue um, uh, in terms of the, the uh, experience of living in, in a rural uh, environment. Uh, what we I think have in the form of MPA3, as I say, in reference to making um, rural communities more vibrant, is a clear approach that's supportive of development that will generate employment opportunities locally. Um, one of the biggest costs we have is, is transport, clearly people having to trans transport themselves to centres of employment. Now, if we can avoid them having to do that, that not only helps with climate change, but it also helps with uh, people's household budgets. Um, the uh, investment in the heat network would be, and, and obviously Mr Mackay alluded to, um, Mr Ewing and myself are, are, uh, and Mr Mackay are working on uh, the uh, implementation of a heat strategy and, and to make sure that there's, uh, we can lower the cost of living in terms of uh, domestic heating. Uh, uh, to, to a major pressure on household budgets and we know that there's a substantial proportion of the rural population who are fuel poor and suffering from fuel poverty. So there are a number of things we can do. Clearly the investment in adaptation measures to, to um, address flood protection for the point the reason you gave earlier on to try and reduce the premium costs um, uh, to, to individuals can help you know, make it more affordable to live in, in rural locations. So there's a number of things we have to do. So I totally recognise uh, the challenge and the fact that it's a real, it's a real challenge in rural areas. Uh, uh, Ms Burgess, from a housing perspective, is, is trying to address um, the retrofitting of, uh, as I say, relatively poor, poorly energy efficient housing in rural areas as a key means by which we address fuel poverty. So there's a number of different uh, government ministers involved in this. It's not just a rural portfolio issue. It's very much a, a core part of what different departments are trying to do. And I think MPA3 is very supportive of trying to create the kind of employment uh, opportunities and, and rural housing indeed opportunities that can address that directly. A very small point from Claudia Bimesh, please. It's not a small point, but I'll make it very brief. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, convener. Um, it's in relation to um, issues around rail in rural Scotland, and um, obviously the affordability and those issues are not within the spatial arguments, but um, it has been highlighted by the Scottish Associ Association for um, Public Transport that um, there, there could be perhaps more about... Um, access to rail and um, opening of other stations and, and, and a range of uh, issues that might help to um, connect people better through rail. And I was quite disappointed to see that um, there's reference to the um, uh, Cairn Ryan in relation to um, improvements to road in relation to air, but very little about the Stranra rail right the way up to Glasgow. So connectivity. We, we make the point um, and very briefly on, on Nigel Don, Don's point about you know, key themes do include inequality and rurality and uh, settlement in the town centre first principle as well. I think I will help uh, the points you referring to in terms of planning. Um, don't be concerned by the omission of certain elements. When Mr uh, Brown and I appeared before uh, the infrastructure committee, we were able to talk about rail uh, connectivity a bit more and explain their uh, that again, this is the, the almost the consenting process, the planning process, and you know, setting out aspirations around, say, high-speed rail or connections between uh, Glasgow and Edinburgh as well, and some other projects. Similarly, it doesn't list all the uh, other um, transport investment projects that you might have expected to see because it doesn't require planning consent. Therefore, it doesn't feature in the document. So, some proposals that are maybe at an earlier stage or indeed at the lobbying point um, won't necessarily feature here but would feature in the, the government's strategic uh, transport uh, review. And that would be the appropriate place to channel requests, demands, instructions, whatever bids for, for real investment. But in principle, in policy principle, of course, we want that modal shift in transport to uh, more environmentally friendly forms of transport, and therefore we're, we're supportive. Uh, but you'll be well aware there's a very specific legislative process to go through when new rail is required, normally requiring an Act of Parliament itself because of the nature of, uh, of legislation. So, so again, don't be concerned by its omission. It's just this is more about certainty of that which is already in the system in, in that respect. And certainly Mr Brown 
will be more than happy to receive, and I'll tell him this after the meeting, representations uh, on further requests for rail. But a very specific process to be undertaken there that isn't necessarily relevant to uh, this process. Can I just add one thing, Convener, uh, at your pleasure, if that's OK? Um, just that the, we are obviously expecting the station investment fund uh, to be opened uh, for bids this year. I believe that's uh, pu public knowledge. So um, it's £30 million. £30 million. And, that's, and that, uh, that fund is open to rural areas to bid for new stations, just every bit as much as urban areas. Thank you very so much for that. So. Some of us have been uh, very restrained in some of the things we've had to say, but we've had a very full answers and indeed a wide range of questions. And we'd like to have, uh, uh, extend our thanks to you for uh, the detail. We'll look forward to mulling them over. Uh, we would be more sociable in a break, but we have another piece of items, uh, business to deal with uh, in private. So I'm afraid we're going to have to stop just now. Thank you for your involvement. Clear the decks and come back in a couple of minutes. I move into private.